Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we're gonna start off with a roll call. Mrs. Colon. Here. Mrs. Flanders. Um, she is on her way, not present at the moment. Uh, Mrs. Lyons. Here. Mrs. Miller. Here. And Mr. Ruiz. Here. We have a quorum. Great. Adoption of the agenda, do I have a motion? So moved. Miller. Second. Colon. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Passes 4 0. Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to let Dr. Mason do this one. All right. Everyone can please stand and repeat after me as we say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dr. Mason, uh, moving on to public comments during the public comments portion of the meeting or during any agenda item. There's an opportunity for the public to speak. Public members who address the board will be limited to a maximum of three minutes per speaker and 30 minutes total per topic. The 30 minute maximum per topic will begin with in-person comments and will be subsequently followed by the reading of electronic submissions until time limit is met. Only comments related to the study session and closed session topic will be heard, read aloud and added to the meeting minutes. For further information, please see the agenda header. Meetings are being recorded for use in the official minutes. Annette, do we have any electronic ones? None. Anybody want to stand up and speak tonight? None? Okay. Moving on, let's go right into the study session, Dr. Mason. Thank you. Um, I will, uh, Derek, if you want to transition up there. Oh. Uh, actually, as Derek's working on that, um, thank you for uh, for meeting with this uh, this evening board and, uh, and in person and virtually. So um, we had a meeting back in January where we talked about facilities and um, began a conversation in regards to potential funding sources, um, projects, and so forth that um, would uh, would need to be considered as top priorities for the district. And what we're bringing back tonight are really three buckets of that conversation. Um, and we'll go through that and, and share that with the board. Um, please excuse the informalness of, uh, of cabinet tonight. We uh, were uh, pleased to say that we participated in what I, I think, um, and uh, board member Colin can speak to it, but has by far been the best um, golf tournament yet of the six that have been put on Bray Ed Foundation. I will not steal their thunder <laughs> on what they project to be able to uh, clear um, today um, from the support, but just a few weeks ago when we didn't know what color tier we were going to be in and whether it was a go or not, and then it was a full throttle go. Um, just a, an incredible shout out. Thank you to Brea Education Foundation as they'll turn around and give all of those dollars to um, that they raise that they will announce at a later time um, to our schools in support of our students and, and the community that rallied. There was a tremendous um, outpouring and showing today from Brea Linda Unified School District um, administrators, teachers, families of, um, of, of folks that work in the district. And so just an incredible turnout as well as the business community and people just uh, when they when they sounded the alarm bell, rung the bell to say, hey, we really need your support. People people really showed up and it, it, uh, it was a fantastic day. So if it looks like maybe we golfed earlier, it's because we did and we came straight from the golf course. So it's what's known as multitasking. So we're going to transition to the podium and we're going to uh, um, present as a, as a team, um, <coughs> excuse me, as we work through, as we work through this presentation. And so uh, um, thank you again for, uh, for being with us. And we are going to, uh, we're going to jump in and, and, uh, and begin. <coughs> um, Again, had the, the context was this is really part two from a facilities presentation that was um, that was given that started in January. And so, uh, again, thank you so much for allowing us to come back and uh, and pick up that conversation. Um, kind of got this broken out into a table of contents or chapters or sections that we're going to be going through. And, and the first thing that I'm going to take us through is 
the district's mission, vision, and values, and really lay a context for um, board adopted mission, vision, and, and our core values, which really sets the directional arrow for the work that we do, whether in the facility space, in the academic program space, in, in the student su support space, and, and certainly in the facilities space. What is it that uh, the board kind of holds near and dear as far as kind of our true north or our guiding um, our, our guiding premises? And, uh, um, and so we're going to go through those. We're going to go through and uh, Rick Champion is going to talk a little bit about the two key facility fundings um, and uh, how those how those funds work and what the focus of those funds are as far as potential available funds that the board can consider for uh, for work moving forward. And again, it's always good to start an evening with a goal in mind. And, and what's our goal? It's really to focus on the future. It's not for just the 21-22 school year. It really is in anticipation of communications that we've had with, um, with city staff on projected um, development that's coming to Brea. What's our current reality as far as classroom um, inventory or vacant space and how those, those things kind of play together as um, we may be fine in the coming year, but what do we need to be thoughtful and thinking of as we move into the future as um, any development, any of the additions of classrooms or facility space is a multi-year process. If it's a permanent building and it's certainly, um, call it a year for, for portables or other things if you have to build, uh, build things out. So preparing for the future is really our overarching goal. And then the three areas that we're really going to be kind of breaking down for the board as far as the three key kind of next areas of or first areas of focus for us are Bray Junior High School and um, looking at that as a middle school concept. And what's the difference between a, a middle school and a, and a junior high school? Junior high school, as we have it currently configured as a seventh and eighth grade campus. So it, it's a place where students come and they spend two years. Um, a middle school concept would be a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade campus, and we'll talk through um, steps that would need to be uh, would need to be had, um, and and also the the causal benefits if uh, if if the board so chooses to explore moving in that direction. Again, this this is for anybody listening at home or, or or listening to this at a future time. That that is not for this upcoming year. This is something that's forward thinking, future thinking. But now is really the time that we need to start talking about it and contemplating it. So um, th this is this has nothing to do with the 21-22 school year as far as a change. It, it's really building for the future. Um, second bucket that we're going to look at is elementary um, facility or classroom vacant space. And um, as development comes on and enrollments increase at different schools, you're going to see um, kind of empty classroom inventory currently for the 21-22 school year and how though we're projected to be fine for the 21-22 school year, um, how we may not be fine in out years as development comes and um, again, need to be thinking thoughtfully in advance um, to, to be able to address that. And then lastly, looking at deferred maintenance, um, we have talked many times before that in the last um, last five years, we've had two, um, two bond campaigns that were unsuccessful that had an eye for deferred maintenance as well as building out some of these other concepts. Um, deferred maintenance is, is just a reality. We do not live in a maintenance-free world and old buildings get one year older every year. Uh, we confirmed that math and um, there, there are some things that are really needing our attention and um, we just need to have conversations with the board. Again, we'll be looking at those funding sources um, as, uh, as Rick comes up as far as um, potential areas where some of the, uh, um, the more pressing deferred maintenance needs um, could potentially be funded. So that is, uh, as, as we set out, that is what we are going to be, what are we gonna be looking at? I'd mentioned the mission, vision, and values. And so just wanna share this, this is found on our website, but um, for those that are just potentially listening at home or, or not familiar, um, BUSD mission. We are a devoted educational community that develops our students to become local and global influencers through dynamic learning experiences. And those things happen in classrooms, in physical spaces. And so um, how does it directly tie into our facilities? Our facilities um, 
necessarily need to be a facilitator or an accelerator of the experiences that our, um, that our students have and not an impediment to what we're trying to do for our students. And so there's definitely a correlation between uh, the nature and quality of our facilities and what we're able to do with our students to, uh, to, to reach our mission. For our vision, providing unlimited possibilities that ignite the educational imagination of all learners to thrive in an ever-changing world. And there's been great growth over the last um, handful of years with new opportunities as robotics courses and engineering and BIDA moving from just a high school program to elementary um, to the junior high, um, building out facility needs uh, or program needs at, at elementary schools um, and the junior high and the high school. Um, we have some inherent limitations with some of our facilities. We um, trans transitioned and transformed a couple of classrooms into a more STEM lab type of multi-use space um, over the last couple of years at Brea Junior High School that have made it more kind of an open shell shareable space. And we need to think thoughtfully as we continue to look at our, our CTE programs and elective programs moving forward is um, what do you what do our facilities need to do to serve the uh, the overall academic um, direction and goals for the district? And so um, there are there are challenges certainly. And then under core values, BOSD core values: innovation, engagement, inspiration, courage, and inclusion. We embrace a culture that celebrates ingenuity, inspires intellectual explore, exploration. We value a community of authentic collaborators to maximize student, sorry for the hanging S out there, student success. We create experiences that spark the love of learning within our educational community. We cultivate a growth mindset to develop resilient learners who are empowered to face adversity. And we nurture an environment that fosters a sense of belonging to celebrate the unique qualities of our diverse community. And, the concept of, of facilities either accelerating or, or potentially getting in the way of all the things that we want to do for students um, <clears throat> will be shown as we, as we talk about the whole uh, Brea Junior High School Middle School concept here in another slide. But um, shared desire related to the BOUSD facilities, it's just at the outset, what, what do we hope for our facilities to do? We desire to have facilities that support all of our instructional programs. We desire to have modern facilities that are updated and relevant to teaching and learning. And we desire to be forward thinking and planning for facility needs related to capacity for today and in the future. So the, the third priority there is really um, looked at in our, when we take a look at our elementary um, lack of space at some of our schools, desire to have modern facilities that really speaks to the deferred maintenance and making sure that our facilities are up to speed and desire to have facilities that support all of our instructional programs. Um, Bright Junior High School is not equipped right now with classroom space or capacity that could even consider a middle school concept. So um, we are wanting to engage with the board and provide some potential um, academic and educational benefits if we did move to a middle school concept but that takes planning, it takes forethought, forethought and ultimately it will take, um, take money to, to build out that possibility. But um, if that is a desire of the district, our facilities are in the way of that because we don't have capacity at the junior high. And so we have some potential solutions that we uh, wanna look at before we, we dive too into those three bucket, too far into those three buckets. I'd like Rick Champion to talk a little bit about the um, funds available and how they live, where they live, and, and, and what they can accomplish for us. So I'm going to step aside and turn it over to Rick for a few minutes. Thank you and good evening. And as we kind of talked about last Thursday night, as we presented the 21-22 budget, um, the state has no funding mechanism in place right now for facilities or deferred maintenance. They've talked about it. There's some stuff in this governor's proposal and the legislature's proposal coming up that um, addresses some of the micro needs like TK and early childhood care learning. So, but those are all just proposals, right? As we look forward. And as of our projections, as we talked about our enrollment, excuse me, enrollment, that's a couple more slides down the road here. 
um, about funding sources of what we have in our sub funds. You know, we talked about Fund 40, which is our facilities fund. That's where proceeds from marketplace and corporate place were um, deposited into, and also the transfer from the Hope um, Fund. And um, interest earnings, right? We don't really contribute to that fund except for those dollars and the interest that is generated with that currently. So as of 631, 2021, the projected balance is about $24.9 million. And the other bucket, as you might say, or the other fund comes from growth within our city, within our boundaries, because we sit almost on top of the city of Brea. And um, good news is we don't share with any other district. We don't know we're, you know, K through TK through 12. So we don't have an elementary that we have to share a high school district or a college facility, but um, we get on the retail side, on the residential side, $4.08 a square foot. And the reason why I emphasize $4 is because you know what it takes to construct in this state, six to $800 per square foot. So just kind of a big mismatch. So um, as new um, projects are being approved on the third floor here at the city planning department, before a condition they can pull permit, they have to pay school developer fees. And every two years we get to look at those, but realistically it'll probably be four dollars and twenty-five cents next year. So, um, but currently those that's about five point three million dollars, and those dollars have to be spent at on enrollment projects. So, in other words, they're they're assessed from new development, and they should be spent on projects that. Um, are impacted by those developments. So, and we have to spend those within a five-year time frame. So, um, perfect use of those funds as we move forward. So, those are current our two buckets. Of course, we have general operating fund, but as we presented out last Thursday night, there's an incredible need for those dollars. So, um, that I will be back. Yep. Yep. So. Um, <clears throat> and again, in the preparing for the future, the, th the three different buckets that we're going to look at, and the first one will be Brea Junior High as a middle school concept, followed by elementary school facility classroom capacity, and then lastly, deferred maintenance. And um, Carrie Torres and, and Brenda are going to uh, join me as we just talk about Brea Junior High School, um, what that looks like for um, building out a, a middle school concept. Carrie and I were both middle school principals once upon a time, and so we're very um, well versed in what it is to have a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade campus as, to a, as opposed to a seventh and eighth grade campus, and there are some real curricular benefits. So um, it, it's true that as we, as we get to the elementary school classroom capacity space, there is some causal benefit if you move sixth graders to a middle school and um, build capacity there that the empty classrooms they leave behind, um, but it would be woefully um, undersold as, a, as an educational plan um, if that was the only benefit. The true benefit of a middle school is really um, the academic benefits. And um, Carrie, do you wanna maybe sure. uh, speak, to, uh, speak to some of those? Great. So um, good evening, uh, community of Bray and Board of Education. Uh, lots of great potential when you consider um, the fact that we currently have a junior high school and the potential to have a junior uh, middle school, right? So we want to go ahead and transition to middle school. One of the great things that happens in in I call it like the junior high middle school years is kids really begin to transition to that secondary school level and they look for ways to be connected to their campus. And so we're always looking for ways to increase student engagement and school connectedness because we know that as students get older that they mature and they think they don't need certain things when actually they even need more. So one of the benefits um, that we can look at to move to a middle school concept, number one, would be to access, um, they would have access to more robust electives. So right now, you know, um, students in sixth grade, let's consider our sixth graders, they are in an elementary school setting and they have one teacher that teaches their core content and then they infuse some activities in STEAM and art and other things. But they spend most of their day on ELA, mathematics, 
um, social science and sometimes science, right? And so we just went through this NGSS adoption. So we'll be seeing more of that. But then they kind of just get other pieces here and there where they can. When you go to a middle school and you're a sixth grader, you're going from having that one teacher and that program to having, in our case, seven periods where students would have the ability to experience a seven period day like our other current seventh and eighth graders. That means they get more of everything, right? So they're getting their math, their English, their social studies, their science, they're getting five days of PE and then five, I'm sorry, five hours of PE a week and more, right? So they can take their elective courses. And so as you may know, at our current junior high, we have a robust elective program that we've built out over the last couple of years to give students multiple opportunities. And so now these students as sixth graders would be at our current junior high considered middle school students and have access to more content, um, obviously academic and then elective. That's really important for students because um, as a sixth grader, you're very limited. And so this allows them to really gain a perspective on that seven through 12 education, really increase that school engagement and that school connectedness because they're starting earlier and they're really increasing that access. And as a former uh, middle school principal, it was wonderful to see all of the students really enjoying a robust elective program. They got to take at least two electives. That was wonderful. And they started that early. So your band kids who want more band, right? Your art kids who want true art are able to do that. Um, at our current junior high school, we have amazing science electives. So now our students who are strong in science can have a science elective as well. Students who are in math can have our Olympiad um, classes and our academic decathlon classes. And so as a parent, it's something to you to reflect on to think my student would have access to more. You um, see in bullet number two, PE and BAN will be offered um, for sixth graders. So again, they'd have access to that. Right now, PE is two times a week, 100 minutes a week in Brea, um, given by an elementary PE teacher. These students would actually be in PE every day, which we've talked about through the pandemic, right? This group has really talked deeply um, about the need for physical activity and how important it is. So now these sixth graders would be getting more activity, which is exciting um, and it's good for our health. We have a great CTE program in Brea that we've really built out at the high school and that we brought down to the junior high. And now if we transition to this middle school concept, our sixth graders would again have purposeful access to those pathways. And that's exceptionally important with the work that we're doing because students right now in California need to have additional opportunities for career and technical education. So that's another opportunity for students. One of the other things that you have when you have a junior high is kids are only with you for two years. So they come in and then they leave and they're gone and they're at the high school. And so going back to that school connectedness, going back to being able to engage students, a three-year program allows us to do that. So kids come in as a sixth grader. We do a great transition program with them. They're with us for seventh grade. They really dig in. And then in eighth grade, we're prepping them for high school. So it's really just a, a way to really ensure that we have eyes on these students for a longer period of time. Um, in theory, we could even bring out more intervention programs for students because by the time a junior high student knows they're struggling, they're gone. Like there's no in between. Like I'm a seventh grader, end of my seventh grade year, am I struggling? I'm in eighth and then I'm gone. Where if you have six, seven, and eight, you really can purposely design supports for students. And we're prime for what we're doing here in Brea with the additional counselor at the junior high, the wellness, the intervention and support staff that we're hiring to really support students. So it's just a great opportunity at this point in time to look at that. And then finally, one of the things you'll hear many times throughout our presentation and that you've heard before and we'll hear again is that we are eager to be competitive with our neighboring districts. We are eager to be in line with some of the districts where they have nicer facilities, if I could say that, or more modern facilities um, or more innovative facilities where some of our students leave us to attend. So as we're making all these decisions and you're hearing more information tonight about all the different reasons why we could move in this direction, consider that you wanna be able to be competitive. And the beauty of Brea, as we've always said is, 
we have one junior high right now, right? We could have one middle school and really build it out. And it would just be so beneficial for students. And it really could increase our competitiveness within our neighborhood for other districts. Good evening, board. Um, it's nice to see you this evening. As, as we present to you the idea of moving sixth grade to our current Brea Junior High, it's not an uncommon concept. And the team that you have assembled with this cabinet has experience with working with sixth grade teachers at a middle school level. And what that would mean is sitting down with our teachers union and really discussing the instructional design at the middle school. As Carrie mentioned, the students can have seven different periods or they could receive instruction from sixth grade teachers with a multiple subject credential in a course setting. Meaning if I were one teacher, I would potentially teach English and social science, Brad would teach math and science with other elective periods built in. So it's a very collaborative process in working with the teachers association in determining how teachers are moved to the middle school because we would do that. We would realign our staffing configuration to meet the needs of our instructional program at the middle school if this is the direction that the board desires. So there are options, but it's a great opportunity. When I've worked with teachers moving to the middle school in this type of setting, it really did work, work out well because part of the plan is to solicit teachers who are really interested in working at the middle school level, who are really interested in working with older students. So this is not a foreign or unexplored concept for this cabinet, something that we're very common doing and we're confident that we could execute it well. Thank you. What you see before uh, you is a, a little snippet from uh, the facility master plan, and that's actually um, architectural um, rendering from, um, from one of the pages on the Bray Junior High School website. <clears throat> and uh, if I can just, uh, if you humor me for a second, just let me read the little, uh, the little uh, words that we put on the page, then I'll kind of help break out what we're looking at. Our facility master plan contains conceptual drawings of needs as identified during the district-wide facility study. Direction by the board is needed to pursue a feasibility study in order to determine how this concept would work on, a Bra on the Bray Junior High campus. Developer fees would be inappropriate. And again, that's one of the two buckets of funding that Rick had uh, mentioned earlier. Developer fees would be an appropriate funding source to pay for the feasibility study. Such a study would provide the board with the necessary information, including potential costs to move forward on the project. A project of this size and scope would require DSA approval and is multiple years in the making. Um, what we have here is, um, DLR group came out and as you remember, did the facility studies and many of you, if not all of you participated in feedback groups. What are the issues related to the campus, so forth. The concept, the reason that they've got um, additional capacity built here is the concept of a middle school was a part of our discussion even back when they when they did that. And what you're looking at in the different, different colors if you, if you look at the, the darker blue, if that's how it's coming through on your screen, there's the square in the upper left-hand corner. That is a gymnasium where the kind of the, the decrepit um, tennis court exists, if you're familiar with the campus. Um, the, the two long <clears throat> rectangular boxes, they're, they're, they're pulled off of one another because that's actually um, represents a two-story building. Um, right now it's a six by six, so that would represent 12, but as we do, do a study and dive in, if it's determined we need 14 as opposed to 12 or 16 as opposed to 12, it would just go from a six room on six room, two-story building to a seven on seven or an eight on eight. And the vision there would be <clears throat> um, to move math, science, and technology teachers into that facility. Um, and then free up other classrooms in what would be the south corner of the campus, um, kind of the corner of Brea Boulevard and, um, and Lambert, and make that more of a designated sixth grade campus. So kind of almost a campus in a campus and, and house sixth graders in, in those locations. And then where you see the other white building and then a blue kind of abutted to the right, 
that is the cafeteria and it's also considered an expansion of our cafeteria um, at Brea Junior High School as it is I'll call it stressed right now to, to meet the needs of a 900 plus student campus. Um, if you add an additional class of 450 kids, just using round numbers, um, we absolutely would need more seating and more space. And so um, what a facility plan does, and again, those are, those are architectural renderings. Those are drawings of concepts. What we don't know <clears throat> is what lays underneath that box where the gymnasium is being considered or where the six by six building is right now? Is there a major electrical box? Is there, is there sewage? Is there, are there other utilities that exist there? Though it fits there in the picture, is that really the most ideal place for that? And that's where the feasibility study would need to come in. We would also work with <coughs> decision insight um, software that we've, that we've used and do projections of what's our sixth grade class look like, not necessarily now, but say three years from now, how many classrooms would they need and what would be sufficient? You certainly don't wanna build 12 classrooms when you need 14, you don't wanna build 14 when you really need 16. So we would do some longitudinal planning and some real projections for what we would need to build out. And then um, the cafeteria renovation or modernization or expansion would just be, um, the architectural firm needing to understand what the size and capacity of the school would be. Clearly, we would need to move to two lunches. Um, again, <laughs> as a middle school principal, once upon a time, um, very straightforward. Um, you know, first lunch, say, is made up of all sixth graders and half of the seventh grade. Second lunch is made up of all the eighth graders and the other half of seventh grade. Um, and you just kind of divide and conquer during those two periods. Um, there's always the question, I'm sure Carrie could, could share this with you as well, parents concerned with, you know, my sixth grader, I don't want him taking PE with eighth graders and changing in the locker room, easily solved by sixth graders having PE first and second period only, seventh graders have PE designated third and fourth period, I mean, I'm making this up, but it, it's illustrative of how you, how you address that. And then eighth grade PE is during periods five and six or, or something similar. So you really can carve up the campus, though everybody is on the same footprint. You really can um, create a nurturing environment for those sixth graders as you welcome them on and, and they become accustomed to be a part of that middle school. I know it would be new to the community of Brea. There'd be all sorts of planning, community meetings, communication with parents. If we were to go that far, but all of that is premature if there's not a board interest in our next step, which really is a facility study. And so, uh, or a feasibility study, because the picture's lovely, it's great in concept, but there's a whole lot more you need to know that can you really build that where it's designed? What are the limitations? And is there a better place to put things? And then when you address those concerns to arrive at um, a better realistic potential costing because our architects that did this study, there was a, an assumed, what did it cost right now per square foot to build a math science building based on other buildings they've built like that, what the industry drive is right now. There's been an escalation in, um, in building cost currently. What does escalation look like over a three-year period, over a five-year period? And what are the architectural um, and engineering? Is it simple to do these three things or is it more difficult than if you were just building on a flat piece of dirt somewhere in a lot? So it's really that, that, that we need that type of um, data back in order for us to bring a strong recommendation to the board. But again, as I had mentioned, it really starts with what, what is tonight about on this particular topic, executive cabinet request direction from the board to proceed in preparing an RFP to solicit proposals to perform a feasibility study related to the following items contained in the Brea Linda Unified School District Facility Master Plan, building a 14 to 16 room two-story math science technology building at Brea Junior High, building a gymnasium at Brea Junior High, and expanding the cafeteria at Brea Junior High. 
we have done all the talking. And so if I could have um, my friends come back up and join, would love to just entertain any board questions on this topic um, at this time before we were to move on to uh, um, a different topic. And whoever's the most appropriate one to answer, we'll, uh, we'll jump in. Nicole, anybody? I, I'm really um, caught a little off guard because um, this wasn't what I was expecting with regards to tonight's uh, program. So um, I guess my biggest question is, um, as you speak of a feasibility study is, can, can they really f tell us what's under the buildings um, with regards to costs and things like that? I mean, I, I feel like we've always been surprised when, when, the, track, when the shovel hits the ground. Uh, yeah, no surprises um, sometimes, unfortunately, are a part of the reality, right? They're part of the right. contingencies you build into your budget. Um, yes, the next step is to, to, uh, to attain professionals that are that have done this over and over and over. When, in my prior districts, we called Title Five searches and other types of. There's underground. There's um, we used to have PG&E, but it's either Southern California Edison. We know that there's underground um, issues at all sites, so those things have to be explored. We don't have rail so close or an airport, um, but there is stuff. There is mechanisms in there. But yes, we always build budgets with contingencies because and with escalations. Um, but um, I don't know if that answered your question, but. I know we also had attempted to put a um, portable on the junior high. And when we did that, we, we learned, <laughs> I know that was before your time, um, but we learned a lot about our limitations on that campus. We learned some new, some new things. And I'm just curious, um, are we able to take anything that we learned from that to kind of give us a, a little bit of a, this is what we have in store for us. Yeah, part part of the part of the issue there was just the location where the concept was be drawn. Um, this process did not go into that decision making. It was just, hey, let's let's do this and let's build it. And um, to avoid any kind of um, hiccups moving forward, um, a feasibility study absolutely is the necessary next step. And <clears throat> the, the the goal isn't to catch anybody off guard, but if there is interest in this, there is no other better way to, to take a deep dive. This is the next step. The next step is that if there's an interest in um, looking at the junior high as a middle school, <clears throat> this is work that needs to be done um, so as to avoid, you know, I, you know, you, you think you're moving forward and, and you run into some some real hiccups. A challenge will be just the sheer age of the campus. Um, it's not, so, you know, how accurate are your plans? How accurate are the lines, the, the, the pipes, the everything else? To our advantage, we're not looking to do anything um, to the, the historic building. These are things that are happening out there. And if you've been to our cafeteria, it's not historic, it's old. And so there's a difference. And so, and it's abutting the, the outer perimeters and the other things are really new builds. And so it's really about what's underground as opposed to <clears throat> sometimes you go to and you, you wanna do some things and you find um, you know, unfortunate things behind walls and so forth. This really, other than the cafeteria on that outer boundary, this really isn't about adding on to other things. It's, it's new. So it's really, what are the utilities and what does the ground underneath look like and what engineering might need to occur? Um, so the takeaways from before are really, for us to move forward at all, this is the necessary step to, to really dive in and, and uh, do the analysis. My other uh, question would be, have we had any initial conversations with staff? Again, <clears throat> short of board direction, this, none of this would be done without board interest. And so if there's board interest, um, there has been conversation, again, back with the facilities. The reason that there were the two buildings that were kind of diagonally blown apart is because it was a part of the discussion. It, it wasn't to add new buildings to Bray Junior High because they needed them based on their current enrollment. 
they're fine if they stay at seventh and eighth grade, but those concepts and building out to a gym to just increase facilities. So it dates back to the facility study, but it would be premature to have deep conversations with, uh, with the association. So there have been conversations, but, but nothing that I would say deep and meaningful because if the board doesn't desire this, it's, it's dead on arrival. There is, there is no moving forward on it. Well, I, I look forward to hearing the, the rest of the, of the presentation because I do think, you know, for me, I, I'd like to get a whole picture sure. of, our, of our needs in the district. And we've got a slide that. to kind of yeah. wrap those things up. So um, I, other, other board members, and again, there, there's, there's two other buckets of things that to, to talk about as well. So other questions? Yes. Um, Rick, can you help me understand you for the developer fees, the 5.3 million, it's every two years is reviewed. Who reviews that? We, um, we, we review them and re report out every year. Oh, okay. And then we do a five year, let's just call it a wrap up. We look back over five years. So I, since I've been on board with Brea, I do it every year. So I, was, I, I report not only the current period, but also the four trailing years back, because that way I'd never have to count what year are we in. Right. So we all, I, I, I review those. That's part of our December board meeting. Okay. Yeah. And then, so we're adding to this fund when mm -hmm. new buildings are being, and, and is that just residential or and businesses? Commercial. Okay. Commercial too. Commercial, I think is, uh, please, I, I think it's 60 something cents per square foot. So okay. not a lot of impact because there's usually not producing a student in our district from a commercial property. Yet as businesses come in, they bring workers and hopefully they will buy homes in Brea, which we've seen it happening. I know in my neighborhood, um, and that's another assumption that we're not going to look at tonight, but your internal change order of properties too. And we know Ray is an older and age in place community. We saw it during our bond, um, you know, campaign. So those numbers are a slow churn too. So, and is it new development only, or is it redevelopment? So like example, if the Sears building ends up being, you know, well, the Brea mall is in our right. facility study. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then that would be considered new. Money. Correct. Okay. I just yeah. wanted to clarify yeah, that. Correct. Okay. And then, um, okay. Nope. That's good for okay. me. Okay. Uh, just, real, just sure real quick. Um, so this would, uh, the, what the um, feasibility study would come out of developer fees and the, if, 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 if we, we liked what we heard. It was something doable. It was something to pursue that would come out of fund 40. It could be both developer fees because this is a look at expanding um, due to enrollment impact. Developer fees are an appropriate place um, to use those funds. Developer fees are more restrictive than fund 40. Um, if you're then going to build a building or do something that's additive to what you currently have, Developer fees could be used for all of that. However, the larger of the two funds is fund 40 as opposed to developer fees. So it could really be a blend of both of them. Um, if you are just trying to fix a pool, fix a tennis court, something that currently exists, developer fees, that's not really adding on to something that exists. That's deferred maintenance. And that's more of a fund 40 or a facility or a general fund expenditure. Um, Developer fees are really because you're building and you're bringing more kids, you're creating an impact. So we need to show that we're offering something more and greater than currently exists. So it's it's lessening the impact of, of the enrollment that you're driving based on, on your development. Okay. So it can be a blend of both. So then um, I, I, my only, it, it's almost, like I don't know where to head with this because step one is to find out if it's something that, that um, we can do that can house our kids the way we expect it to. Um, other, when we got to that point, my questions, of course, and I think Carrie touched on it a little bit, you touched on all the positives, you know, that it has on our kids. And um, I will have to say that just prematurely, you know, having been a sixth grade teacher, I was so against it. I was just like, no, you keep them babies as long as you can kind of thing. And then I'm absolutely flipped on that. Be, um, and so for me, that's a big, a big win because um, now having had family members in middle schools in our neighboring districts and um, seeing how they do such a great job of keeping the sixth graders um, 
gosh, I don't want to use segregated, but kind of uh, keeping them to themselves and then, you know, growing, but actually growing them and, and um, their academics at the same time as what you sort of mentioned. It's really impressive. So I wonder, are there any, what are the negatives when, and I just mean directly when it comes to the students, not the money. When you take a look at, um, you know, sixth graders and what sixth graders are today versus what sixth graders were 20 years ago. I mean, we really have, our students have more capacity and more maturity than they did, believe it or not, a while back. So in terms of competency, you know, moving a sixth, a sixth grader from elementary to a middle school campus, they're, they're capable of doing great things. Um, the only downside that we've ever experienced, and I'll speak from that personally, having been a middle school principal is um, sometimes sixth graders tend to be a little bit squirrely, sometimes. Um, and so it takes them a couple of um, weeks to kind of work through that. Um, one of the things that we do to respond to that is a quality middle school program will do a blend of integration, okay, inclusion, and then they also have their own kind of coursework in classes. So um, Brenda talked about coring kids together, or you have somebody teaching math and science and English and social studies, where that is holistically sixth grade. And then they get integrated into other grade level type activities and or <clears throat> courses or blends, six, seven, right? Things that they can do to grow themselves. So really that was the only downside I ever experienced. And then of course, the um, reality that parents are like, oh my God, my baby's in middle school, not in elementary school anymore. So really un educating our families to what their students will experience and what the benefits are. So sometimes I've had to work on that with families is to ensure that they understand what it's going to be like and that it's going to be okay and that they're actually going to thrive and not to be fearful of that. And I think many, I don't know for sure, but I know in Alinda, uh, many sixth grade classrooms already, and I used to too in Anaheim, we called it departmentalized. Yes. Right. They're already doing a mini junior high so, as much as they can. Um, yes. I don't know if all of ours do that, but some do. Yeah. So one of the other things that's important for us to recognize is that um, kids really academically, like I mentioned, competency start to excel. And so some of our sixth grade teams throughout our district have leveled their kids already. So, you know, as a sixth grade team, one will take this group, another will take this group, another will take this group. Um, and so they've leveled in mathematics. They've done subject matter areas to kind of meet the best meet the needs of the students. Because what you're going to find is that you're going to have students who accelerate in core content areas and math being the number one accelerator, right? So in sixth grade, you are limited. There is only so much you can do. But once you change that formula and kids become a middle school, they have access to additional opportunities and acceleration points within their instructional program. So Sometimes you'll hear sixth grade teachers talk about the fact that they're doing the obviously the best work that they can with the students they have, but they have some students who could get more, right? And so they're ready for that. They're ready for that next level education. And with the way our schools are structured, uh, any elementary school is structured, you're, you're using that content, you're using that curriculum that you have, and that is at times can be limiting. Okay. So, well, then the last thing I guess I'm just going to say is that as a comment, um, you're wanting to see if there's interest. And I don't see how we can't be interested in getting data or seeing what's possible because living on the other side of town where, well, in the side of town where we're about to have, you know, 1100 homes and we're about to grow, we're already maxed at that school. I can't imagine having one elementary school with like 1200 kids and another with three or whatever, I'm making numbers. But um, we have to start thinking now to be prepared for that day so that we don't have a problem, you know, in the future. So I am interested in knowing what uh, a feasibility study would tell us, because I think that's where we have to start. But um, I don't know how much that study costs, but either way, we are forced to do a study before we make a decision like this, this huge, and talk further about it. And, you know, to see if there's board interest in moving forward, I think we, I, so yes, I am interested in um, figuring out how to start, um, just start thinking ahead. So that's all I got tonight. Gail, do you have anything? Can you hear me? There. Can you hear me? Yes. There you go. Yes. <clears throat> um, well, I'm. 
probably premature too, because I haven't had a chance really to look through the rest of what we're going to go through here, but I just feel like um, I'm out of order, I guess, is what I'll say in terms of, okay, we have, we know how much we have in developer fees and in the other fund 40 money, but I, I guess I, I thought we were going to do kind of an overview of our whole facility master plan and, and talk about the things that are needed at each school site and the things that we have to do and the things that are maybe optional to do. And then coupled with that, the things that our community asked us to do. And the, the biggest thing I see, you know, missing from what I've seen so far is we haven't had any discussion again about safety. And that was one of our community's biggest asks was, and again, we kind of got a reprieve on it because we haven't been on campus this whole last year, but security was big. Fencing was big. Um, cameras and security systems were big. Uh, you know, protecting our front office areas was a big concern. So I just, before we even talk about moving on to directing funds towards one school, which I am totally in faith, I, I, I've supported this idea for a really long time of moving into a middle school model. But again, it comes back to, do we have the money to do it? Do we actually have the funds to do it? We can use both developer fees and fund 40 fees on this project because it would still benefit the people where the developer fees are coming from. But you just bring up a you just brought up a great point, Carrie, in that what happens at Olinda? Just because we take the sixth grade off of at Olinda, that doesn't mean we're not going to need to build another classroom wing there with what we've heard enrollment could be. So what's the cost of that? Um, you know, if I remember correctly, the cost of whatever idea we had way back when, when we did the facility plan, but the junior high, we talked about a two-story building, and I think it was, uh, was it like six or seven million dollars? Was that a, about the price range? Yeah, I, I would hesitate to embrace those dollars from 2018 or the, the you think there more? You think it would be more now? Well, or less? <clears throat> depends on what's in the building. It, it depends upon what you're building out. It depends upon if it's a 12 room or a 14 or a 16 room. And in short of a facility uh, or a feasibility study, that is really when you go through someone just applying, what does it cost to build something right now in a school's times how many square feet times a number? Um, Still, you still don't know what it's going to be until you go out to bid to build it. But it, it, we could bring back dollars that are more grounded in in the things that are actually being analyzed. They they didn't do they didn't do that level of assessment. No, I, I think trusting Cole, Trustee Colin uh, brought up earlier about surprises, right? So it's easy to build a twelve classroom building, but that campus has aged over the years. So we'd have to look at electrical, sewer, water parking how many staff would it support so that's what a study would do is take that thirty thousand foot level and just drill it down not saying twenty two thousand square feet times four hundred eighty dollars per square feet equals x there will be additional costs on top of how many square foot dollars because we see it just walking right now i mean we have campuses as you know the country hills the bus bar and the electrical panel we can replace the bus bar but do we replace the panel for growth. And so those kind of things will come up. Uh, so that'll be taken into the my other, oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, no, go, please. Well, I guess my other question is if we don't do this, then what? So if we don't do this, we still have the issues we're talking, you know, and again, that then goes back to enrollment on each campus and the, mm -hmm. the number or necessity of buildings that we would need, whether that would be portable buildings or, you know, actual structure buildings. We, you know, we talked about, <clears throat> I mean, all of that, if I remember right, is in the facility master plan as well. We have Falcon Academy where you've talked about just even not having the appropriate bathroom structure for our kinders to even utilize we so that's a big issue just 
in that whole little quadrant in, in, uh, in Falcon. And that doesn't go away even if you do the sixth grade somewhere else. So there's like all these, I just see there's so many things that we need to be putting into this overall picture before we can pluck out one project and say, we're gonna do it this way. Because if, if we don't, if we can't, and quite honestly, I guess the other, I understand the staff, you haven't had a lot of conversations with the staff. Is there anyone else in the gallery right now? For, no. Okay. So I'm just wondering like, you know, our administrator at that campus, she knows a lot about what, you know, what people's thermometers are about this whole idea. I know that it sounds like we have a lot of um, forward movement and that we think it's good for all the right reasons, but we've been in this place before where this is a big shift for our community. And I know when it was brought up in community settings before, it was just attacked, quite honestly, because people like the junior high concept. And I'm not saying that that's the only reason you make a decision or not make a decision, but I think we have to be prepared that, you know, we have staff that's going to be involved. We have community that will be involved. Um, I know there was other issues, there was other scenarios tossed around, you know, um, maybe K-8s on various campuses throughout our, um, our district. And why would or would that not work? Um, so I guess I'm just looking at, I need to know that this is the best decision and path to move forward. And that in light of saying we're gonna move forward, we understand all the other things that we're gonna put on the back burner. Because even if it is a $6 million price tag, you know you're gonna add a couple something, somethings to that. Mm -hmm. And to me, that takes a big chunk off of your 25, let's just call it, let's just call it 26. I'll give you a little bit of leeway there. And then 5.3. Mm -hmm. um, we have so many other things that, you know, uh, we have to address and we need to think about all of those before we can say, because there's some pretty big things. There's walkways at the, you know, at the high school. We've talked about all of you know, you've talked about the athletic facilities at the high school. Um, we don't have an NPR. We don't have a, a maker space. We don't have any space at Falcon for any large group um, sort of whatever you want to do, whether it's robotics, coding, uh, anything. We have no, we've never had any space at, at Falcon. Um, you've got Mariposa with limited uh, kinder as well and daycare setups. There's not even really a lot of space to put anything there. So, you know, that the question might be asked and answered right there. There's no physical property for us to put anything. That's where we got into a crunch. That the last point we talked about this, I think, Dr. Mason, right? We mm -hmm. wanted to do something and we literally, there's nowhere to drop a portable or there's nowhere to put anything. Um, so I'm just, I'm struggling right now to put it all in perspective, quite honestly. Yeah. And, and the, beauty of a yeah. yeah. the beauty of a study oh, session is this is where we have those conversations. Um, <clears throat> Cabinet believes that the junior high is, is the number one issue in, in improving and driving our overall academic program. Um, the question was asked by somebody about, you know, what, what, are the, what do you have to give up? And quite frankly, um, you think of a 12-year-old and a sixth grader right now goes out to recess and, and that's part of his or her day. And what you would be trading for is five periods a week of PE and five periods a week of band or other electives or, or things that really advantage those students getting to um, explore and experience a more robust academic program. To your point of, well, you know, we have issues and, and again, the next, the next bucket that we'll take a look at is um, elementary space and empty classrooms, depending upon um, if there is interest in this, then that leads down a different short-term and long-term path. If every school potentially got two to three classrooms back, you know, in out years, because sixth grade is no longer on elementary campuses. If that is not the direction, then you're really looking at a plan to do we need a wing somewhere or do we need to 
intermittently drop portables as numbers grow over time. Um, Cabinet has talked about the K-8. Um, you know, when, when Olinda was contemplated, a K-8 was a part of that. That, I, that absolutely predates me. However, there is no efficiency to carving out and separating seventh and eighth graders on six elementary campuses because there are not, there's not enough students to generate their own Spanish teacher and their own shop teacher. There isn't a facility for that. Seventh and eighth graders do not need just a classroom to learn in. They need designated, they don't have um, science labs. And so the concept of Aero Vista becoming a K-8 school, um, talk about an incredible expense and, and, and a lack of um, efficiency. It really is. We have a fully functioning junior high and we would have a more robust sixth grade academic experience in Brea if we moved to a middle school. It is premature to say that we're, we're doing it. It's premature to say that um, that's, that's the commitment, but it's not necessarily premature to look at that as the first step forward because by taking that step, we will be able to analyze and bring back what might it cost to do these things. And if the board continues to have an interest in that, then the removal and the giving back in three years of all elementary schools, it may preclude us from needing to add portable somewhere, but in the absence of moving forward and doing something, we will get to the next slide. It's going to be, our approach is going to be add a portable here, add a portable there. Is it time to add yet another portable and then just start kind of tetracine enrollment and space throughout the district, which would not be the most efficient way to go. And it doesn't do anything to, to drive the sixth grade academic program that I think would be benefited in a, in a middle school. And, and I think that's one of the reasons when the portables came up at Laurel that some, you know, there were some of us who, it just gives us shivers because Portables have never been, they've never been temporary for us. And without the, um, without the knowledge that we have a geo bond that can support actually planned facility buildings, that's kind of, it's, it's almost forcing, it forces our hand to actually consider those options. And nobody wants to consider those options. But again, if, if our pot is only so big, um, we have to consider everything we need to do. And I, I totally agree. This is, this is a big bang for your buck. This is, is doing things curricularly. This is doing things that can help, you know, alleviate the stressors caused by not enough classroom space on every campus. But the reality is we might not, like I said, if we don't do this, we have to have option B and what is sure. that cost? And we have to look at that as a viable option because that's what we're charged to do as oversight of our entire facility master plan with less than $40 yeah. million. Dollars in yeah. It. If, if there is not board interest in this, when we pivot to this next set of slides, looking at elementary space, the, the approach is going to be when do we need a new portable and how many and, and start building out a timeline to just start dropping them. And there'll be some inherent hardships at certain campuses, Country Hills, hardships at Mariposa where there's just not a physical space to, to put them. Aero Vista, you can put more space. Laurel has, has space. Falcon has some targeted space, not a ton, but, but, but they could, and, and it doesn't address overcrowding in different places. And then you get to, you look at, you know, I, I don't even want to say out loud, but I'm about to, you know, do you look at boundary lines and attendance and, and it's just, that's, that's an ugly conversation. And, um, and so we feel that this is one option. If we moved in this direction, again, feasibility, um, is this possible? What might it cost? what's a timeline and what would it generate as, as relief space at elementary schools while ratcheting up the academic experience and um, academic life and program for sixth graders throughout the campus. So um, we, we do have deferred maintenance slide tonight where we talk about some of those ongoing realities. And we also have um, uh, the next 
set of slides that, that takes a look at our elementary and projected enrollment that the city um, is projecting over the next 10-ish years for, uh, for development in town and what the student generation might look like. Yeah, jump in. Um, and Gail, Cabinet appreciates your concerns. We understand that the facility master plan that was conducted back in 2018 was a very deep and expansive document with um, areas of our school needs that were immediate and then some that were projected maintenance areas down the road. And knowing that we have limited funds, Cabinet spent the time discussing where can we create the most opportunities for our students and where can we create some growth areas in our elementary schools. And so by presenting this idea to the board, it's certainly not a commitment from the board. It just gives us the uh, leeway to get the RFP, to get the proposals, uh, like Brad was talking about, the feasibility for turning our middle, our junior high into a middle school. So we can free up some space that we'll get to, Brad will get to in the next part of the presentation. So we certainly agree and acknowledge that our district's needs far exceed the funding that we've discussed with the board tonight. And so we tried to prioritize for the board where we thought we could make the most impact for our students and our community based on the resources that we have today. And we do not need board commitment right now on this. I just, <clears throat> as we leave here tonight, we would like direction, but we have a summary slide later, which, which asks for you, after you hear everything in total, ask for direction. You can tell us thank you and no thank you on any and all of the three, or we'd like you to start moving in this particular direction. So any other questions on Bray Junior High? It doesn't mean we can't double back on it, but we've got other things to look at. Yeah. I've just got, I got two of them. They're both for Rick. And they're really quick answers, Rick. You don't have to get up. Um, would an RF, would that facility, a feasibility study, would it include like things such as how we're going to handle parking, drop off, pickup, staggered start and end time, stuff like that? This goes on code updates, uh, Title V searches, fire, both the building updates, the code changes changed rapidly. I'm just so, worried yeah. about like how we have such a major problem with Laurel as far as dropping off and picking up, would the feasibility study be included as part of that RFP? Feasibility study would not be district-wide. If I, I, know, I just want to make more, sure, I'm for not, Bray Junior High, yes, it absolutely okay. would. What would it mean for traffic? What would 450 more kids mean? What would the additional staff be, both certificated and classified? It would take in total, though it, it looks at those three things, it looks at what does the impact of that do and what are those kind of concentric circles, causation occur? And so it's not just... $487 a square foot by 22,000 square feet. It's what, what is the true impact and what would need to be done in order to um, execute okay. this. And then the last one I have is like, does the does the feasibility study look kind of like broaden itself to like, for example, a gym? Would we think about, would it think about possibly teaming with the city to build a gym instead and making a community share space or something like that? Or is it just our gym that we're looking at? Well, that would be if the board has an interest and we come back with a cost, then we can start to get creative. Are there joint use facilities? Are there grant funds that the city has access to that we do not, where we get it every single day of the school year, we get it every afternoon that we need it. We get, we get to identify what we need. And then the extra time, there are absolutely districts all throughout the state that have those those facility use agreements we have it in a lesser degree because it's an outdoor space at lagos de moreno but there are countless examples of communities and school districts that share spaces for mutual benefit um, and you enter agreements for cleaning for oversight for maintenance and for utilization too premature right now but as we move forward i would absolutely we would absolutely engage the city for um Again, if that's the board's direction, we would absolutely engage in those conversations to mitigate costs on our side. And um, a gym that stays shut for over half the year because it's weekends, nights, or summer um, is not maximizing its its utility in a community. So, okay, thank yes. you. We, we refresh my memory, but isn't, again, just to make sure we're talking about two separate things. This is a classroom wing that we're actually talking about tonight. So the gymnasium was separate. And mm -hmm. I wanna say again, in the facility master plan that those were both tagged around $6 million, each of them. Yeah, I, 
Go, going into tonight, I didn't spend a lot of time looking at the old costs, believing that they're not reflective of anything than the projection from two to three years ago. So I can go back and look at those things and have a link tonight that we can go. But I, I would I would put no money on them being truly grounded in reality. They, they could be spot on and they could be way off. And I, I couldn't tell you either way. Can I ask one more question? Um, can you remind me the instructional minutes for elementary versus junior high? You don't have to get up, Carrie. You can just tell me. Um, they, we have grade span instructional minutes. And so you have, um, 2k through, uh, 2k, 2k and k is 180, 230 for first through third and fourth through six for elementary is a minimum. And keep in mind, it's daily minimum. And then weekly is 240, okay. uh, but we go beyond that. We're about 360 because we have to have annual minutes and then daily minutes. Okay. So and then seventh, eighth would be seventh and eighth is a minimum of 240 um, instructional minutes per day. But again, we have annual minutes. You have to get closer to 56 ish thousand and you're, I'd have to look the exact number up um, annually. So we have to do both daily, weekly, and then we have an annual total. Okay. Yeah. I was just thinking for the sixth graders, what difference it would be for if we went with the middle school. Yeah. It's increased minutes, right. um, but it's also the way the minutes are carved up but we do have a longer day in secondary. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. But not like significantly longer where no. kids, yeah. it's not oppressively longer. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and Rick, we just uh, chatted for a second, just uh, to the funding conversation um, with not knowing the direction that the, the state takes as far as passing potential facility bonds. You don't have to pass your own bond to qualify um, for state bond matching dollars. Facility studies get us in a place where we could be potentially in a queue for executing projects moving forward. Um, and regardless of how you arrive at the dollar you spend, whether it's developer fee or fund 40 or whatever, if you're moving forward and you bring your dollars to the table, um, you can qualify for matches for projects that, that you work on. So not doing anything won't get us any closer to potentially being um, kind of nimble in that space were there to be another state bond. Um, so uh, that's just another consideration for potential funding that, again, we have no control over. But um, if, if you're not doing projects, you're not going to benefit from that. Anything else on Bray, Bray Junior High? Or uh, again, we can we can loop we can loop back. We have a back button as well. So, uh, um, do we want to have one oh, thing? Yeah, about, yeah. Um, that's an interesting point. I mean, taking advantage of of uh, the state's funding um, with regards to getting in line for that. <laughs> Um, what, what stage of a process would you need to be in to get in line for those dollars? Do you have yeah. to actually be, have spent them? No. Yes. And you have to have ready pre-approved projects ready to go too. So of course there's a matching component, 40, 60, 50, 50, whatever the case may be, but having nothing. And we saw just this past, uh, March 2020, where the state actually, I mean, November, state, November, November <laughs> which seems like so years ago, the state failed on it. They're going to go out again in 2022. And they're talking about micro bonds coming out too for just broadband. So there's lots of um, additional funding sources, but we need to bring something to the table, which is we're ready to go, not just a concept. So we actually got plans pre approved, stamped in some cases. And, and you don't miss out. It's not like if your project wasn't timed for when a bond came forward, you just kind of missed out. Bummer for your timing. You can put projects in the queue for development that get funded with the next bond that comes. It may not come in the perfect timing that you'd like it. You may spend your, I'll just use $10 million. You'll spend your $10 million, but you will get reimbursed whether it's the 50-50 type of development or a 40-60, you'll get your 4 million back someday. It, it just isn't, you know, when your last bill necessarily is due on the project. But those that benefit from those matching funds are those that are engaged in, in the facilities space. Okay. 
again, we can come back on this one, but to the point that had been that had been asked and, and so forth regarding um, what about our elementary schools? Um, ask Rick to reach out to all of our principals to confirm total classroom space. So this is portables as well as fixed classrooms um, on our campuses and identifiable open classrooms that are available for um, for teachers, Rick, don't go anywhere, um, for, uh, um, <clears throat> for teachers to be able to move in. And the statistical outlier there, Aero Vista, with four availables. The other thing that we, we need to remember is that we have used a new classroom now over the last three years with our dual language immersion program. So um, as we added a kinder and then a first and then a second, as we continue to roll up, some of that will be um, eaten, maybe not a one-to-one -one if, if enrollment shifts and, you know, you used to have say three fourth grade teachers and now you need two, two in English and, and one in dual immersion, but there definitely is going to be an encroachment on that space moving forward. So it's true that we have it right now, but as we project into the future, as that program grows, um, that number will necessarily um, dwindle. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Rick to talk a little bit about this space, and then it's gonna go over into projected development that the city has on the docket um, over the next decade, so. Yeah. One of the, the beautiful things about living in Brea is there is still space, there's still buildable space in the city. And um, I've started, as you know, in my weekly report, started meeting with the city planning every other week and really just sharing ideas. Sometimes the meetings go as quick as five minutes, sometimes it goes 25 minutes, but really just keeping abreast of new developments, whether they're real developments or just concepts and how they impact um, um, us, right? Because we were right on top. So, you know, just like I talked about the budget, it's based on assumptions. These are just assumptions, but we know the city of Brea is moving forward with building. Um, just to give you some example, there's the Brea 265, as Trustee Flanders just pointed out. They have planned to deliver units in 2024. I mean, if you take, whether it's a conservative, an aggressive, or a moderate approach, you know, I'm, I'm there's 1,900 units that the city housing units, whether they're multifamily, single family detached, single family attached, or I term this new term high density multifamily, which is like um, the, uh, what do you call it over? The Heinz Project, I think is what it's called. Avalon Bay. Avalon Bay. Um, that's, you know, it has an impact. There is a generation of people that will live there. Now, will they become our po student population? So that's where we start using student generation rates and stuff. But um, just to give you an idea, this is just a linear graph of the units that are projected to come on line to this, in the city of Brea. This is a conservative approach. Now, this is 85% of what they think. So it's like 1,600 units based out over the 10 years. Um, and again, like I spoke, this, this excludes any of the internal functions. In other words, people sell their homes and in theory, a younger family moves in with children at impact and it's impacting in my neighborhood across the street from me <laughs> as we speak. But um, whether the timeline is shifted to the left or to the, to the right, they are coming, they are building, they are gonna be issuing permits. So um, as we move forward and there's interest from other areas as brick and mortar goes more into online and there might be some other changes coming down through the city, but this is the major projects that are coming online, whether they affect the east side of Brea or the west side, they affect all of Brea because they're gonna start impacting us and start pushing through. So it is coming through. I will give later um, and give you, a um, as we get closer to the summer, a um, report, a residential development research report, which was just done last April. Um, and um, they had decision insight folks who did it for us, spoke with the city planning, the city engineer, and what they believe and what's coming through. So a lot of the projects, as you see, Brea 265, the mall, Park Place, Plaza, Brea Plaza, Central Park, Central Park Village, they're already been talked about. So they're coming. And as they're talking about Brea having that downtown central core, we know that the um, student, this is the projected development. But really, what does that affect us um, here? You know, when we plan out um, our 
how the impact is, we use student generation rates. Again, I use the conservative numbers, right? We're below the state issues that every time a new housing unit is produced, um, it's 0.7 students and 0.5 of those are high school. I'm just kind of rounding the numbers a little bit, but those numbers are coming. There's an impact from the development. Again, you know, whether the timeline shifts a little bit to the left or to the right, if they're coming, we believe they're coming based on that information. And having that relationship with city planning and updating continuously um, has allowed it. But we use the most conservative dwelling units um, for each type and the student generation, but how's that really impact? This is kind of a graph to kind of show you where it is. Yellow is the elementary um, impact. The blue is the current seven, eight middle school impact. And the high school is the upper green bar. So these are not a cumulative, these are new student generation rates. So um, as we move forward through all that, we'll see an impact. Now, again, it could shift to the left, it could shift to the right, but this is the impact using a 85% model of what the city believes is gonna happen. So if it's more aggressive, of course, marketing conditions, stuff that, microeconomics, it doesn't, we don't affect, but this, this will happen in addition to the internal. Oh, oh yes, oh. yeah. Oh, are you saying me? I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, I, didn't hi, you, <laughs> I didn't know if you saw my hand. Yes. Um, so can we just go back to, I think like two slides before where you showed each of the schools and the classrooms that they had. Yeah, that one, thanks. So my question is, when you look at each of these campuses, again, my simple math is there's about two sixth grade classrooms at each campus. Are there any places where that's not the case? I don't know, I'm not familiar with every campus's enrollment, so. Two to three. Yeah. Can you tell us by, by campus how many sixth grade classrooms are at each one of those campuses? I, I would like to know that. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll pull that up off, off to the side and we'll come back and report that. We, we have that not pull upable on this, but on the side we will and we'll, we can get that answer in just a second. Okay, and then when you talk about the growth in the students, Rick, it's hard again to put it in perspective from, it's hard for me to put it in perspective. Like, where are all those kids going? You named off a bunch of developments. I know we've talked about mm -hmm. how it's going to impact Olinda, but like somebody threw out Sears. I mean, is that going to be Laurel Avalon or Bay, be Country Hills? Or yeah. Like who's Avalon going where? Bay on the corner of Brea um, or Birch and State College is Laurel Elementary School. The mall will be Laurel Elementary School. Um, and a lot of those big numbers in those out years are the projected Heinz uh, development. And that's going to be Olinda Elementary School, obviously Bray Junior High School. And when I say Laurel, that's the elementary study. Everything, as you know, affects the junior high and everything affects the high school since we're a one junior high and a one high school town. But Laurel um, and- Wait, Heinz is- Wait, Hines, what's that? I'm sorry. The, that Avalon, goes to Avalon Bay. They would go to Country Hills, wouldn't they? Avalon Bay. You said Hines instead of 265 yeah. while you were listing all that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let me back up. Okay. Avalon Bay on the corner of Birch and State College is Laurel. The mall is Laurel. And Olinda is era 265. And that is okay. Olinda. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know what I said, but a lot of sun today golfing. So, uh, but th th those are the three kind of large conceptual developments right now. Um, and but is there uh, any um, development at Falcon or Mariposa or Aero Vista? In infill projects, yeah. not not any not any major impact large development. Th those so are the even three the large. Low income housing that's going to go in. That. Yeah, the, the interesting thing, too, that, that we also can't predict the future is that there's a generation rate based on square footage, based on nature and type of development. Um, and, and this is, I might be diving into the weeds, but I'm going to dive. Um, Brea, because they are a, it is a community that has been um, kind of characterized by aging in place, there are more homes here 
than in an average community that do not have people that have children. So when we do our generation rates right now, it is really the number of our students over all the different types of housing that are in Brea, and that generates a number. That number is not necessarily reflective of any one home. It is a net average of all the homes, all the living places divided by students. The difference between um, uh, a Mercury project or an Avalon Bay or the mall is that the question is, is that really targeting families Whereas era 265 is absolutely targeting families. And so whereas one development may underproduce students, another may overproduce students. And so it really is a net average. So every time one thing is built, you can't say that 0.48 kids live there in elementary and 0.21 for junior high and 0.37 at high school. But how do we arrive at our generation rates? It's all of the homes in Brea divided by the number and nature of types of students. But the things that are being developed, some market to families and some aren't marketing to families. So there may not be as many kids living at Sears um, as or Avalon Bay as there would be in era 265. But the net average over time says this is what a home in Brea generates. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, I, I think probably you know where I'm headed is that when you look at Again, we're looking at it, it just, you know, one, we're not looking at all the slices of the data. And so it's hard because if we're saying that, okay, if we take sixth grade off every camp, elementary campus, and then we funnel them to the junior high, we've solved that immediate problem of, we see that each of our campuses were strapped for space. Mm -hmm. But then we go into these out years and the things that you're describing, and it is that we're going to even have more kids in those campuses that could still require us to drop a portable or to build absolutely a building to support them and so yes. you know we haven't solved the problem for the campuses that we just were talking about country hills laurel and olinda and then long term at least sure like, again but some of those really campuses know. Some of those campuses are landlocked and there's not an ability because there's not a track of land that's developable. And so they are kind of where they're at. And the, the, the potential is to get two or three classrooms back may solve their issues indefinitely, at least over the next kind of generation of student, because then their enrollment fluctuates based on someone moving out of a home and a younger family moving in and just that give and take that that just natural dynamic and it also can be mitigated a little bit in 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 transfers and it, and it can be managed a bit in in that manner and to your earlier question Gail we have the answer Country Hills has three um, sixth grade classrooms Olinda has three Falcon has three Mariposa has three Aero Vista has two and Laurel has two so three yeah, for everybody, wrong. not on named Aero Vista. Or, campuses. I was wrong. I'm, I'm sorry. I was wrong on four campuses. Oh, that's, well. you know, you that's four more classrooms. That... That's enough to qualify for the play at home version. Thanks. So it's um, three for everybody, not named Aero Vista or Laurel, and they're yep. both two. So if you're a landlocked campus to get that back, that may be the breathing room necessary um, to kind of solve your issues for many years to come short of some sort of major turnover of development for some reason. Um, Olinda is a separate issue, but if they got three classrooms back, um, it that's think if it's upper grades or, or, or whatever, you know, that's somewhere between 75 to, you know, 90, 90 some odd additional students. Um, and it may be enough to just say when when era 265, if, if it goes through, and again, we still don't know how many homes and what the real development, nor the timetable, um, you know, Olinda may still need one more wing someday at some point, but it will also allow some, some runway for developer fees to come in and so forth. It will take a while to build homes and populate them to the another 75 to 90 or a hundred students. So, um, it absolutely addresses some short-term needs or aligns with 
um, initial impacts of, of some of those developments. And so when we came, I, I don't remember when it was, but um, and talked about a portable at Falcon and three at Laurel, it was with the understanding that Avalon Bay and the mall, when those come to pass, um, Laurel is the school where they're going to go to. And because Laurel sits in the city's core, which they've had direction from the state, and Rick will be more eloquent in explaining this, but um, there is a pressure on all cities for increased housing and increased affordable housing. Um, the core is pretty much served by the, the um, attendance boundary of Laurel. So not only are those impacts coming to Laurel, but other potential development. Rick, I don't know if you want to speak to that or. Before, before we turn it over to Rick Gale, I wanted to share that the numbers Brad provided are for gen ed sixth grade students and classrooms only. So we do have growing needs within our special ed population and our emotionally disturbed population. So for, and our mod severe. So for example, we're lo we've added a mod severe classroom to Olinda for the 21-22 school year. So that information, the classroom numbers that we gave you are only for gen ed. It does not speak to this, our growing special education population, just to keep that in mind. Okay. Which well, also creates an impact on our classroom capacity right. availability. Well, and okay, so my other thing would be as you extrapolated all those numbers of what Rick had, you know, shown what the junior high growth and then eventually the high school, I think we have a little less issue at the high school, but do. when we take all these students, and again, now we're projecting that now we have sixth grade on the Brea junior high campus, the, the build of the two story is 14, 16 classrooms. Well Part that, yes, um, it, we, we would want to do a study. We'd want to do the projections. We want to sit down and talk about that longitudinal impact. Um, and we had 12 on the, um, on the facilities uh, master plan, but in, in just math on the back of a napkin, I, I'm really thinking it's really more of a 14 or 16 room building. Again, you don't want to build something the day after you do the ribbon cutting, you need some more space. And so it really is forward thinking enough to where if we're turning dirt and building things, it's much easier to build an additional two or four rooms now than, you know, wish you had done it three years from now. And I don't remember, I'm not confident in my knowledge of uh, mandates on class size. Is it six through eight is different than elementary one through five? I know a one through three is something totally different, but yeah, well, is six, uh, six in the one. next level, the next tier where we can have more kids in a classroom? Grades four through six allow four more grades. Six. So our current, yes, our current contract allows for 34. Once we're over 35, we do play, excuse me, we do pay class overages. So our TK to three school-wide average is 28 to one, and then grades four through six is 34. And what's seven through whatever else? Seven through 12 is also 34 if you're in the core classes. So that is not inclusive of PE and art and other elective courses. We look at the actual physical space in the classroom, but for your core classes, such as science, math, English, social science, it is 34, grades so four through no 12. Change for the in, okay. in Gail, Correct. to your point, um, if we just added up our um, th the needs for if every sixth grade teacher was at Brea Junior High School right now, that would be 16 classrooms. However, when you divide that population of sixth graders over six different schools, it's less efficient than um, it would be if you put them all in one place. So, you know, maybe you could get away with 15 or, or, or 14 or a different number, but um, 12, I know, would be insufficient if we're looking to move teachers out of existing classrooms into this new space. Um, it would need to be 14 at a minimum and quite likely 16 just to, to create some, some growth opportunity. Okay. Okay, sorry. I think I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. Slide yeah, I'm not lost track of where we were. Yeah. You were talking about... Yeah, I was... And it was yeah. why I was... Um, while we were talking, having questions back and forth, 
the 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 push for uh, Brea 265, which would impact, let's just say, Alinda, the way the map is right now. Um, this 10-year look, they're only halfway through their build out. So whether it's 1,100 or 1,000 homes, this 10-year lookout is you know halfway through. With most of it being single-family um, detached homes, which be your family type homes, right? The rest is multi-story uh, or multi-family and stuff, so high density. So we know there will be an impact at Brea, I mean, at Alinda, um, but this will give us a step-by-step -step probably measured look if we you know, focus on the junior high for this example and get additional classrooms. Then once that's done and completed, we'll start seeing as they start delivering units at even at the moderate proposal, will be 2024, 25, 26, when they really start getting into production. So then there could be some timing of that too. So um, just some some data as I was looking through that, so. Yeah, yeah I would, uh, I, 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 I know the comment that's coming. I feel ill-prepared to make a decision right now. So I'm not, I'm not asking for a decision, but tonight would like direction on, on this concept, an executive cabinet request direction for the board to proceed in preparing a proposal to create not an outside feasibility study, but whether you were, would like to direct us to prepare a proposal to create additional classroom space at our elementary schools to accommodate projected enrollment growth and the need for additional elementary classroom space throughout the district. And again, the three schools um, of most immediate need are Olinda, Laurel, and Falcon, but that's not at the exclusion of others. Mariposa and Country Hills um, are, are a challenge, space, um, challenge for space as well. And again, to the earlier board comments of it feels like, you know, we've got a lot of rivaling voices or things and so forth. And this is really incumbent upon, do you have an interest in pursuing the junior high as a middle school? If that answer is yes, and we move forward, we take, um, you know, what are our short term, more immediate needs at the elementary level? Um, if three years from now, we were looking to, to roll into a, um, a middle school concept of the junior high, um, we, we would make shorter term, and again, it, when I say short terms, th these are not large wings and, and you know permanent buildings. These are these are where might we need portables to embrace um, anticipated or necessary growth and limited number of campuses. Um, and if that is something the board would like us to engage in, we will leave here tonight and we will begin that process and bring back recommendations. Um, so that that's where we're at. Don't don't need. Oh, go. Questions are great, but I, I I don't need an answer on this right now. I just had one question with regards to you know when we brought up the Laurel portables before. Mm -hmm. um, one of my my questions was you know have we looked at moving programs off of Laurel's campus like the state preschool? I. I you know, Laurel or Aero Vista has a lot of space, and and not just. Uh, not just classrooms, but spaces to drop portables. Has there been any thought with regards to moving programs to a campus that could accommodate them, especially given that uh, dropping portables on Laurel makes me nervous with the parking issues and the, and the traffic issues? You know, it, could we look at moving programs off? So we have evaluated that. So there's two programs that we have looked at moving and those are pertain to our special education students. Um, and so that is actually something that we had planned to do pre COVID. So that's something that we've evaluated. When it comes to state preschool, you cannot place all your state preschools in one location. Okay. And so um, we do have to have an equitable distribution of those programs. And so having them at Laurel and Air Vista at this point in time makes sense. So there They're, is a program at Air Vista already. Yes. For state mm -hmm. preschool. We do okay. have one um, for um, the state preschool program. Um, they serve Title I communities. So they need to be placed there initially. And then they, of course, take parent paid portions as well as their space available. Okay. So those, those facilities have to stay. The other thing about preschool, which we've also may have mentioned in the past is preschool has its own regulations for spaces. So they are um, certified by the state of California in the early learning childhood development section of CDE. So you can't just take, for example, even a parent paid preschool and just move it into a space. You actually have to have a proper space for that. 
And we've had that discussion as well at Olinda because we have a preschool there. Uh, we wanted to, we've talked about what that would look like to move the preschool. And we have evaluated that. And at this time we cannot mm -hmm. um, due to those space limitations. So those are just things for us to consider. Um, the other thing is when it comes to special education programs, we cannot potentially overload one site with special education programs as well. So that's another um, equitable distribution of programs that we need to look at. And so what we chose to do this year, as you've heard already, is we moved one program, uh, Mod Severe, onto Olinda's campus because we need to now distribute our programs because we're growing. A lot of moving pieces, that's a lot of things I didn't for know us that about consider. special ed either because mm -hmm. I would assume, you know, like in other districts, they have whole schools that are dedicated to special ed programs. So. And, and historically, that's what California did. And many school districts mm -hmm. um, had specialized schools and the, uh, the model has gone away from that and they're trying to distribute those. There's an, a movement for equity amongst um, our facilities. And I um, see the value in that. Yeah. I, I and, um, and I can understand again, coming from a district who had a specialized school, it helps focus your resources. Right. So from a financial standpoint, it works, but from an equity standpoint and from a civil liberties standpoint, it does not. And so you're going to see that trend is happening where people are moving their, their programs out. But we're maxed out like at Laurel, even if we wanted to keep all of them there, we couldn't. Um, and so we've had to look at moving. That's where we landed at putting a space at Olinda um, because we have space at this moment in time. Okay. Thank you. And it's not enough to just have our own issues. We've heard the governor talk about potential TK for all, you know, and so forth. And so we're just talking if that conversation never existed and never amounted to anything. Um, as we get more clear direction on that, that's just another layer of potential impact for us. Um, and so it's also a part of, of this. We're, we're not flush in facilities. And um, the purpose of tonight is really to bring that need to kind of the surface level and, and, get, and get some board direction. And again, junior high, sinks or swims as far as moving forward. And then based on that, the downstream decisions of what does the impact look in the more immediate world for, for our elementary. So um, the more they legislate, the more it creates curveballs and, and other things that we're gonna have to consider. We, we don't have enough to move forward on any of that right now. So, um, and again, don't need board direction on this right now, but we'll, we'll loop back when we've uh, kind of finished that conversation. Any other questions on this? Question. Yeah. Okay. Can you um, refresh my memory on the portable timeline? <clears throat> Say you get direction. What is, is it 18 months longer than that from start to finish? You know, it, it, eight to 10, I'm just round, you know, again, okay. things can come up where you want to put up there, drop them at a certain site. We might have to reroute some irrigation or electrical or panels like trustee Colin was bringing up earlier that, you know, we build and try to build in those contingencies. So and, and it, right what, what age group is this for? If it's just a box, yeah. that's different than if it's it's tying into sewer and water lines and other things. And so, but um, if you think, you know, eight months to a year, and so purposeful decisions would need to be made in anticipation for, for out years. Right. And then yeah. the funding would be from fund 40 or the developer fees, we or it would, doesn't matter. We, we would most be inclined to use developer fees. It's the more restrictive of the two funds. And so um, it, it's fund 40. Think of it as cash developer fees. Think of it as a gift card. The, and the gift card is for the expansion of facilities. And so it's a, it's a perfect way to use those dollars. Um, so we would be most interested in spending those first and in saving fund $40 for other, other things that developer fees couldn't fund. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And with regards to eight to 10 months, is it a different situation if it's an emergency situation? Cause I feel like when we dropped that portable during the, we had that earth, earthquake in, we dropped a portable yeah. like in no time. It not will. not having been a part of that that portable, I'm guessing didn't have um, plumbing and other things and right. so forth. And you may very well have gotten some variance, but DSA it's has temporary. to approve it because it was. It's oh, it's temporary. Okay. Yeah. And so I I can't speak to that because I I wasn't here and don't know don't know. But sounds like we know. So okay. 
Um, anything else on this? Again, we can loop back, but uh, moving on then to deferred maintenance and I'm gonna um, significant facility needs. Again, um, we have got a link to the facility master plan where we didn't need it and, and refer to it. But um, for, for those of you that, that have it, that's a, that's a live link to uh, our facility master plan. And I've asked Rick to talk through um, some of our significant pressing and please know, and those of you that have been around for the deferred or the, the facility master plan, this in no way is comprehensive. These are just some of the things that are kind of screaming at us right now. Yeah. Yeah. These are just um, some of the issues. Obviously if something broke, we would fix it. Right. AKA if a plumbing line broke at um, uh, Mariposa, right because it was improperly installed. And over the years of stress, it created an issue. So we would fix the issue, but not the problem. I'm using this as a pipe in my analogy here, right? So there's, there's big issues that um, sometimes take a lot of architectural planning, right? So we kind of just kind of went through, you know, the high school, for example, the pool and tennis courts, right? Tennis courts are, are almost now considered, I would consider them unplayable. unplayable unless you want to play up, be on the uphill side playing downhill. And I guess then you get the advantage. But, you know, for this year, we didn't have tennis matches. We had to go out and find a facility to hold our tennis games at the high school level. But the pool, as you know, we've invested dollars in the pool pump, the pool house, the pool heater. Um, but the structural of it is themselves, if you can kind of see my hands, they're sliding, let's just say they're sliding downhill. So it's not just rip out the concrete, refloat it, make it flat and re-pour. There's something issues that's making it slide down. And so we would really need to find an engineer to really develop that project. So maybe structurally that slope has to be built up, which is probably what's going to happen, happen. But we need to have some of these concept plans, we, in feasibility stands, you know, plans in itself just to attest to try to get those costs to see is that the right place to have a tennis court? Do we offer tennis? Do we, all those high level things. I'm just gonna come back and give you, here's dollars to some of the solutions that we see. You know, the, at the high school, the walkways in the concrete areas, there, um, when I first came on, I thought it was a flood because I saw water lines, you know, two inches, three inches above the walkway. It's actually where the concrete was poured years ago and now it has sunk. So the water is actually running back into the buildings and causing, you know, structural damage. Um, so a lot of those, as you know, as we make changes, not just the changes of the, some of the, the band-aids changes we've been doing by shaving the concrete to eliminate trip hazards. I'm talking structurally pull out the concrete and re-pour. And anytime you do stuff with walkways and slopes, you sometimes have to get in, um, run it through the state to make sure you're ADA compatible. So... Um, the PA soundboard, our um, performing arts center there, the building, that soundboard, which controls not only the lights and the sound, but also controls the emergency lights. So that, um, as we know over the years, is starting to fail. It's a 30-year-old piece of equipment. Um, it's been run on uh, chewing gum and band-aids. It's been putting the stuff together. And a lot of the parts now, we just can't, we've been cannibalizing, cannibalizing other parts. And so that piece of $100,000 equipment, um, it looks like it's going to need to be adjusted. And we just, we were going to look at that process going forward at our neighbors who have built um, similar systems. Um, but just to give an example, I mean, there's many, there's the elevator issues. There's um, water in the pump house, at, you know, in the elevator room. There's the field where it, it pools up water. There's lots of little issues that obviously we have to, big dollar ticket items that we have to look at. And then sometimes you just can't say, well, let's just go fix the track. But we actually have to make sure we engineer it out, right? You have to hire an architect, you know, for example. Elementary schools across the board, um, working with Jeff Ferrato, the HVAC systems. I know some of the systems, like the junior high school, through the Prop 39, a lot of them were replaced. But across the board, these 5, 10, 20 ton units are um, old, right? They're inefficient. They're not, we noticed this was as we went through COVID and went through adding additional MERV filters to for the filtration. Um, they're just failing, but they're also so big that they actually are embedded into the structural membrane of the um, roofing. And that's why we kind of look at roofing restorations. 
So anytime you do a change on a roof, you have to run that through the state architect. And DSA is a state architect and a division of state architects. So those things have to be recalculated. These are big ticket items, right? They have to be planned out. They're coming, they're in the facility master plan, whether they um, have a timeline of two years or 10 years or 20 years, we still have to account for these things. And building structures, like structural, um, Era Vista comes to mind. You probably saw in a, a project of the week where our carpenter went in there and just did a mirac miraculous um, refacing of the um, preschool area there. Um, but a lot of those are the buildings are just structurally, you know, not really up to par, right? So again, how does that fit into the big picture moving forward? And the district wide kind of fo focusing back on our generator. Yes, we have a generator, emergency generator at the high school. Um, it's been in an operable for, I don't know, let's just call it 10 years. Um, that runs the emergency lights, not only in the PAC building, but also runs the central kitchen's main refrigeration and freezer. So that needs to be replaced. Um, that's a big ticket item. We started working on that a little bit to um, before pre-COVID. And so we have some preliminary numbers, but you know, that is not only engineering, we have to go through AQND or Southern California Air Quality Management District just to get some of these things because it's a, it's a generation unit that runs on fossil fuel. Uh, at our MOT yard, the CNG fueling station, um, that needs some tender loving care. That's a big ticket item too. That if we, if that unit fails, which is a slow fill system. So in other words, when they hook up at night, it takes the entire nighttime process to fill. Um, we do have a, a, an outside source, Fullerton Joint Union High School, where you can go do a quick fill, but obviously that system is aged in place and needs to be filled. And then the parking lots, you know, as, as Trustee Lyon said about safety needs, this is an, this is an, an area too. Structurally, they're, they're aging, right? The structural asphalt is cracking. A lot of areas were on an expansive dirt in our, in our cities, some of it in the high school, even at Olinda. Um, and of course we would engineer those out with the drop and pick up, right? Because as we see that over at Laurels, we're going through that process as we share the curb with the city. Um, but every site could be argued that it's got issues with drop up, and pick, drop off and pick up. So obviously those are big ticket items that are gonna need some study time and some dollar times, which um, as we move forward, as we start building this project together, so. Yeah, um, <clears throat> again, th this is an illustrative list of countless projects. And one of the questions that had been raised before our comments was, where do things fit in priority? Um, safety things that are, that are broken, trips and falls, you know, hazards, air conditioning goes out or whatever. We absolutely fix those things because we can't not maintain them. Um, I would love to have the funds that a, that a bond measure would have afforded to just update all of these systems. We very much have had a respond to broken um, approach to um, many of these kinds of things. And um, classroom space is not a luxury that, that that's, you've got to start there and things flow, flow down from there. The, these are downstream issues until something absolutely breaks. It's a downstream issue. If an HVAC system is really, really old, but still operating, it's functional. And so we're not looking for recommendations to do that, but um, there is the reality of an operational budget that needs to be identified for <clears throat> Rick and Jeff as things break. It's better to budget for it than have to go find money after the fact. Um, some of these things are luxuries. Again, the pool's not a luxury if you're a swimmer. It's a necessity any more than a basketball court. It's a luxury to a volleyball player or a basketball player. But classrooms aren't luxuries, they're necessities. And so we started the presentation looking at classroom loading, um, our capacity, um, our need for those spaces. There are not other funding sources that we're not sharing with you that it could address these deferred maintenance. So Fund 40, these are not necessarily appropriate expenses for developer fees because it's, it's, it's replacing things that exist. It's not expanding um, facilities that, that are really under the umbrella of, of deferred or um, developer fees. Fund 40 
is where these kinds of things can get addressed over time. Um, and so if you're asking for priorities, our priority is absolutely addressing the, the coming need for, for additional classroom space. And by looking at Bridge in your high school, yes, it addresses the classroom space, but it addresses the classroom space by really making our academic program um, offerings more robust and more rigorous. So um, I think it makes us more competitive. I think it provides a much greater academic opportunity for, um, for our sixth grade students while still addressing um, some of the facility needs that have been, uh, been identified. So um, questions. Um, do we have enough money to do all of the things that you want to do? I, I knew the answer to that. I got that, that one, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. I was just hoping for the other answer. No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, you good? Yeah, there's one more slide. One more slide. <laughs> oh yeah, asking for board direction. So we're 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 just still in the the discussion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gail, talk, I think Gail's talking. Can't hear. Gail, we can't hear you if you're talking. I, I, I think you were. There you go. Yeah. Believe me, my husband's wanting that uh, that mute button um, this week. Um, I was concerned of things that I don't see on this on this list on this slide. Um, Again, that, th th this is not comprehensive. It, it, it's to show that there are a variety of facilities. Safety, as you mentioned before, there there's fencing. There are other there are other broken things. And it, please 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 share. But um, our facility deferred um, deferred maintenance plan under our facility master plan is many more than nine bullets. This is just illustrative of massive expensive things that that are representative of a much longer list. Well, and there's only a couple on here that I would say that you could really categorize as, you know, optional, um, at least addressing them on some level. Um, but I guess you mentioned security, you know, the fencing, the whatever we're going to do at the high school to make it more secure. Again, I am just really, I'm, I'm very apprehensive about the fact that we're coming, you know, it's been a year where we haven't been on campuses. So none of those concerns have been, you know, really top of mind, but they, are, they will come back. I mean, we know they're going to come back. So we have to have a rough idea of what's that even going to cost us to do and, and how much of it are we going to be committed to doing. The other thing is we haven't talked about it all that we know is coming down the pipe is we need, we need gender neutral bathrooms on all of our campuses. We need, if you're going to go to the junior high, and especially if you're going to have sixth graders at the junior high, you're going to have to revamp that whole locker room. And that's not even to talk about what you need to do at the high school. I mean, you can't have huge rooms, changing rooms. I mean, it's not going to be okay. It's not going to fly in, in this next generation of, of uh, years for us. So yeah. those are, those are huge expenses and they're, they're things that we won't be able to avoid. I mean, those things are right around the corner and yeah. the fact that we haven't addressed them yet is already causing problems on some of our campuses for our kids to be able to feel safe, to use a restroom for them to be able to feel safe using a locker room. We're gonna to have to address those things. Yeah. And, and in the junior high, <clears throat> with the building of a gymnasium, that would be a necessary space. We, we have- um, But that's another $6 million. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 again, depending upon how projects move forward depends upon, can you address them as part of the solution of a gymnasium if it's, just you got what you got, and so figure it out. That's a different approach to um, looking at restrooms, and we have we have very non-modern um, locker rooms at at the junior high school, and with the gymnasium, um, some open spaces and and some some design features that um, would include things like you mentioned would be a part of that plan. 
Well, I mean, we know our neighbors ended up putting up curtains, you know, for locker rooms. I mean, that was their solution. I, I mean, they, they were forced to do it like on a dime. They had to change the way they mm -hmm. had those rooms configured. And so it just takes one person to be uncomfortable for the, you know, that domino can fall over very easily. Mm -hmm. And it's something we should be concerned about anyway, going into, you know, just again, where our kids are emotionally and socially Sure. Um, those are big things. Those are, those are big things. Sure. Um, and, and then, you know, we mentioned, you know, the elevator is not really optional either. Uh, again, yeah. uh, as far as a liability for us, because we've had issues where people, I mean, we only have one, um, right. Mm -hmm. And that's a long way away from the whole other end of the building. Um, so, <laughs> you know, if there's been, there's been some issues with that. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, you know, then I start thinking about all the career technical stuff that we know if we're going to grow curricular programs at the high school and they're going to come from the junior high, both of those areas are going to need to have dollars and put into them. We have, I'm thank goodness we have a robotics class coming online, but we, we have nothing. We don't, how are we going to support it um, with the facility as well as how are we going to support if we're going to expand, if we would expand food service or um, I mean, there, you could just name off any of them, video production no. or whatever other people are calling that medical careers. Those are facility things. And that's not even to mention, right? We, we know our science classrooms, our basic science classrooms don't have water or gas to do experiments. Those are big things that we need to address at some point. So, you know, and, and that's not an easy fix either, as you know, I mean, or yep. we would have fixed it already. So those are other really big ticket yeah. items that we have to start thinking about and they have to go in this pot of things that we potentially might need to spend money on. And I need to know, like, give me a ballpark on any of this stuff. I, and I won't hold you to it, but I just need to have my mind around what is all of those things cost? Yeah, we, we can on the deferred maintenance side, we can we can work on that. We're, we're not going to provide those or be able to provide those numbers tonight, but we can do that. Um, one of the essential come out of, of tonight things is direction from the board on how you would most be comfortable with with us addressing the forward looking classroom capacity issue. That is an absolute driver that is going to eat at. Um, at these facility funds and to um, Dina's point, do we have enough money to do all of this? It's a resounding no. And, and so it really is a prioritization of classroom capacity is abs we, we can't not have space for kids. And so in, in solving that, is the junior high a part of that? It's almost a decision tree. Is the junior high a part of that solution? Yes or no? If it is, it leads us down a path and it comes with, with some associated costs with a feasibility study, but it also comes with, well, when we get that dollar total of the $30 million that are contemplated in this, um, you know, whatever that number is, you you subtract it out if it qualifies because of um agedness on your campus for modernization probably not a lot because these are, are, are new builds but if it is for um growth then we would qualify for some state funds so we can book that as a as, as non-received but a future a future income stream to where we can pick the line back up on some of these other projects. <clears throat> some of these things we're looking at on this list are going to break in this next year or two years. And it goes from what would you like us to do to us telling you that we'll be fixing and replacing the HVAC unit on some school somewhere. Um, it's nice to have a proactive approach, whether it's a dollar amount per year to attack these as we, as we prioritize and move forward or project-based prioritization. And so we can do that, but really wanted to bring this back to the conscious level of the board that when we make decisions on the facility side of things to expanding classrooms, it takes away these dollars that are available to potentially spend on these other deferred maintenance facilities. And we really just need to hear from the board kind of I want to be so clear in communicating that classroom capacity is the number, I mean, health, safety, and welfare, we will fix and we will find a way to fund those things. After having said that, the next most proactive, productive thing we can do is 
is stare at our capacity issue and come up with a plan of how we're going to address that. And so that, again, we need decision direction on Bray Junior High. And then based on that, we need decision direction on bringing back direction from you to bring back a plan for where we envision we will need to <coughs> add some additional classroom space in, in the interim to just address enrollment needs. We have 69 kids right now on online academy. If they came back to some of these schools, our zero or some of our ones might turn to zero and some of our zeros may be a negative one. So um, it, it's, it's bought us, it bought us a lot of relief this year. It's buying us a level of relief next year, but um, the kids, the kids are coming and, and we have an upcoming presentation with the board where we'll be sharing with you our um, our enrollment over time, what it looks like going into a, a snapshot right now, going into the 21-22 school year. We continue to enroll all summer, and we have students that that enroll through the beginning of the school year. But um, I don't know if it's the next board meeting. I don't have it memorized in my head. But in, in either the next or the the, the follow-up board meeting, we'll be sharing you what our enrollment currently looks like right now compared to uh, compared to past years at um, at CBED's time, which is in October. So um, we just we need to engage in these conversations and get get direction from the board. And again, I, I wish we had every answer. I, I wish if we did this, then we know all these things to be true. But what we really need to do is pick our first priority, our first step, and then what's the next thing, and then other things fall in after that. Because I don't want to do a bunch of deferred maintenance and run out of the funds necessary to do classroom expansion necessary to, to house our kids. Any other questions? What say you, Carrie? What say you? Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, no, I don't have a question. I just, I'm, I'm just going to go down the line. You're asking, it's like you're asking us three, three requests. And so, so yeah. So if uh, I can, if I can maybe jump to the summary, um, kind of next step. Um, these are the three buckets. Brea Junior High um, Brea Junior High exploration of facility expansion to move to a middle school campus uh, model, sixth through eighth grade model. Seeking board authorization to pursue or authorization or direction to pursue a feasibility study of expanding the campus to include a new 14 to 16 room math science and technology building, a gymnasium and an expansion of the cafeteria. Um, the second one was elementary classroom space is limited and will be further impacted by anticipated housing development in Brea, seeking board direction for adding additional classroom space at our elementary schools to allow for anticipated enrollment growth over the next several years. And then the deferred maintenance we just looked at. Projects are an ongoing issue that impact the uh, functionality of our district facilities, seeking board direction and funding authorization to prefer um, to pursue deferred maintenance projects. So what would be helpful tonight would be say under deferred maintenance, you know, you direct us to bring back a list it, with the associated anticipated costs. And again, we can go back and we can take a look at what um, our facility master plan referenced. And instead of having a luminous document, really pick some of these core themes, find out what those projects are and find out what the dollars associated were. Um, elementary classroom really, again, is a downstream decision from what would you like to see at Brea Junior High? Are you interested in a facility or feasibility study? Again, yes, we need to go chase that. We need to look at what, um, bring back what some ultimate costs might be for that, what the benefit to our elementary schools are. Regardless of the decision, there's still some more immediate potential needs at our elementary, some of our elementary schools. So we would bring back a recommendation for one or two or three campuses that we're anticipating a, a need that would not be satisfied three years from now if we were interested in moving forward in a middle school concept. So <clears throat> they're kind of interrelated, but, but they also are also standalone. What would you like us to do with Brea Junior High? What would you like us to do with the elementaries? And what would you like us to do on deferred maintenance? How can we best inform you or provide direction to us and we will uh, we will get working on the things you want us to get working on. Sure, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
now I'll say that. Um, the first one for, I, I already did touch on that. I would, I don't, like I said, we don't have a choice, but we do, um, we have a choice of doing nothing or doing something. So I, I'm going for the do something. Um, I would like us to do the feasibility plan um, with input um, and meetings with the BJH um, admin and staff since they know that school best and the needs and the broken things and the what what would work. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't I wouldn't want that to be done without their input. Sure. Um, and then so that's my opinion on that one. You, you kind of call it a trickle down. So for the second one, elementary, I guess. I don't really know how to answer that one until we knew what the feasibility plan results were yeah. for the junior high. I would like, I guess, assuming that you still have to plan for these kids. If we didn't do anything, that's what you're asking. And of yeah, course, but, the but of course, even if it became back a yes and you fell in love with the plan and you want to move forward to the junior high, I think it might be three years before, you know, we're, we're moving kids. Um, so in, are you asking in those so forth. three years? In, in the interim, we may okay. need to do something on one or two or three campuses just to manage okay. our students. Then on, for me on that one, my, the answer is, of course, because I need to know what um, that looks like in the interim, if that's temporary portables, if that's mm -hmm. like Dina had asked earlier, um, you know, if you need a portable that isn't temporary, then I guess we would need to st get started on that. So um of course. And then the third one, um, deferred maintenance projects. This one's a hard one because they're all hard ones, but this one, you know, we do have a, an enormous wish list, uh, needs, wants, dreams, and we have the whole facility master plan. So, and I know they all don't qualify under deferred maintenance. So my answer would be yes to bring back according to our original facility master plan, which probably still needs some tweaking and updating that was why we have a live document, but um, I would want to be, I would be interested in seeing what you all brought back uh, from those, those lists with what you said, what Gail said, safety in mind with the wants and needs of our community. Um, and which one of those, which, which of those things fall under deferred maintenance, which qualify for those funds, because some of the things we need or want don't qualify. So I would like Yes, yes, yes. Let me answer. <laughs> okay. And, and, and deferred maintenance, we brought it back a, a costed out priority list. That doesn't, that's no authorization to move forward on it, but to just fur, further stack them in levels of priority. And again, the other, with the understanding, if something breaks that is absolutely essential, it's going to get fixed. And, and we've always operated that manner and it's, it's a way you take cuts. Um, and, <clears throat> We'll just keep that dialogue going. Rick's done a good job on his his weekly updates and Jeff on just kind of necessary projects and so forth. But um, dusting off the the facility master plan and, and kind of bringing back the, the the list and prioritizing and trying to ascribe some level of dollars, realizing their estimates they're they're not deliverables at that price. But just so you can see what what some of those things might look like. Let me let me add a PS and sooner than later, bringing those back for us to help prioritize mm -hmm. sooner than later mm -hmm. would be helpful so we can get going and keep the momentum and, um, you know, not get outdated again. And you talked earlier. I mean, I know we make we manufacture things for our business and wood and metal and rubber can't get rubber right now because it's in India. So there are things that are crazy prices. So I know you're going to come back with those. Maybe they'll go on sale next year. But um, so, yeah, I want to be part, I would want our board to be part of the, Absolutely. the list of prioritizing what qualifies. So that's a yes with that caveat. Okay. And, and we're jotting notes to everybody's comments and Annette's taking notes. It's audioed and, and we're writing things down. So, uh, so the reason I was a little bit thrown off in the beginning of the presentation was I was actually thinking we were doing number three tonight. Oh. So I am very in favor of getting that list to look at it and prioritize. And so, uh, yes, I, I think there's a lot of safety things that we need to look at, especially. Yeah. Um, so that's a definite yes. <clears throat> With regards to the Brea Junior High um, feasibility study, my biggest concern is in Brea, where I feel like when we 
if we are to move in this direction to do this feasibility study, I'm a I'm concerned about what that signals to our community without having done any education to our community. I think people are going to freak out. Um, so I, I would be in, in favor of doing a feasibility study because I do agree with you know, the concern for, for space issues. I see all the positives. I think it's a great idea moving forward. I have huge concerns about getting, you know, buy-in from the staff and, and educating our public on the positives um, moving forward if we are going to do that feasibility study. So that's, I'll just leave it at that. Um, with regards to dropping portables, um, you know, we have to do what we have to do. My, my only concern is if we're going to tell our community that we have issues with um, traffic at Laurel, I, I just can't rationalize dropping portables. I feel like we're we're locked at a at a population standpoint right now. Um, I would be more in, for, in favor of finding ways of moving uh, the population around or finding other other uh, ways of doing that because it just seems like dropping more students is creating <laughs> a bigger safety hazard um, until we get that situation rectified. Um, but with regards to the other campuses, you know, I, I'm very interested in, in making sure that there's enough space. I know Falcon needs that kindergarten with the bathroom portable. I mean, that's a, a huge need. Um, so, you know, whatever you guys need to do. And that's not a feasibility study. That is really commissioning us to go do that work and bringing back a recommendation. And it really would be... Um, this isn't a 10 year plan. What might we need in 10 years? This is really what might we need in the next few um, and, and build towards that. So um, duly noted and, and understanding the Laurel concern in addition and so forth um, <clears throat> with those developments already sitting where they sit, um, you know, I, whatever they generate as far as students, they're Laurel kids and, and just needing to, um, well, and I guess before they're that. populated, is there an, uh, a possibility of changing their their yeah. boundaries before we, they're built? We can look at that. But again, other than Aero Vista, who have the four that will grow into some of those classrooms over the next years, everybody was at one or zero. So it, it's not like there are these outliers. Um, you know, Falcon picks up, but I think Avocado, if I've got the street right, just north of that development. But they're at a zero or a one as well, and and we're already contemplating. You know what might we need to add to to add to them? Um, so we'll dive in and and we'll we'll bring back some recommendations and some analysis based on what, I just what don't might want to be create doable. A worse problem I, than I appreciate that. Got. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Um, in regards to the junior high, if you've ever listened to a school board meeting, I probably bring up class sizes almost every single time. So. We can't have smaller class sizes if we don't have classrooms. So that to me, looking for going sixth, seventh, and eighth seems like a natural progression. Um, also with the electives, if you've ever looked at the electives list, there are so many great opportunities for our seventh and eighth graders. And I would love to give another year that kids have an opportunity to have some of those electives. So speaking from the parent side, that's definitely the, the way I'm looking at. So I would definitely want to have a feasibility um, plan for that. The elementary schools, same thing with the smaller class sizes. There's no option when there's nothing there. Um, I know there's computer labs and whatnot. I don't know that could be a, a possibility of maybe doing them in the classroom, but I don't even want to touch them. Some of the, some of those things have already even been cobbled up at some of our schools. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I, I trust your judgment and your research. So um, I would definitely want to look at that. And then the deferred maintenance, like the others have said, I would just like more information and in where the, the priority list is. So with pricing, I know if you talk to any contractor, like Carrie said, wood has gone up at least yeah. three times the amount since, you know, what in the last year. So um, we can't really go off of our facility master plan. So um, it's an idea, but be prepared the concepts, for a the shark. concepts exist there, even right. if the cost may be a little irrelevant. Right, right. So, so yes, I would be yes on all three. Thank you, mm -hmm. Gail. 
Well, I just need, I guess, a clarification on how is this going to impact classroom size, class size? It's not going to lower class size to do this. We're just moving rooms from one from one location to another, correct? Yeah, the, the, the primary focus is just, we just need, class sizes is, is a, a mechanism of number of teachers and number of students. It, it, it's not number of classrooms, because if you have lesser numbers of students, you just have lesser number of teachers. And so it, it wouldn't be to chase instead of a 28 to one, a, a 26 to one or a 25 to one or another number. What it does prevent is overcrowding and some flexibility within a campus. Um, <clears throat> so I, it, okay, it, so it's, like not, it's not a direct, oh, go ahead. Okay. If you have a classroom available on a site, you might be able to do something different. To break a so. combo up or something. Whereas if you have no other option, you may combo up to get maximum load in every particular classroom. When you're out of options, you don't have any. That wasn't very profound. Yep. Okay. I just want to make sure I understand that. Yeah, it, it's it's not, six, it's not it's not it is literally is a big class. Yeah, it's literally it's literally thirty four is big. It's literally seating for kids in a place to put them. It, it's not just it, it, the the driver isn't for lower class sizes. The the driver is to have necessary number of classrooms to put all your kids in because we can't violate the contract. Um, and I, I, I've been in districts, not this one, where we've closed campuses and we've had to call it Falcon. You know, you moving across the street, we cannot put another child in TK3 because it violates. And so now we, we're transporting a kid that's at Falcon to, you know, to, to, to some other school somewhere. Um, we're, we're not at that place, but as we continue to feel stress in all of our campuses, it's possible that you really truly don't have room for kids anymore and you start to overflow them. And that's, that's ugly. Well, that brings up a question. Are we still getting a good portion of our kinders coming in or not just kinders, I guess at Laurel, are we still getting a lot of transfer students into that campus? Um, yes, it, in pre, yeah. pre COVID. Yes, we were, we were completely full. And if you go back to um, just before the pandemic, we had come to the board with the same concern regarding the facility challenges at Laurel, because we did not have enough space to accommodate the kids that were there. And so what we're seeing right now is we're seeing the resurgence of um, enrollment coming back. And so I would imagine the answer will be yes. And again, this is an off year. So we have seen enrollment right. fluctuate at all of our schools. But Laurel was um, Laurel, both Laurel and Fast were both the two schools that were busting at the seams pre pre COVID. And you hate to have a magnet that you can't draw kids to <laughs> anymore. Right. Um, but if the what you're saying is enrollment could become from, I mean, it'll be coming from the development, we won't be able to accept transfers in if the kids that are going to be coming in the door anyway are going to take those seats. So. Um, unless you build out more unless, capacity. Yeah, unless you unless make you space for them. Capacity. Sure. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. Um, okay, so I'm supposed to be answering these three questions. <laughs> and the, old, the, the, the dollar expense one here is that if we get direction that the board desires for a facility study or a feasibility plan, I keep using the wrong words, sorry. Um, that's the one that generates expense. The other is generating work. And, um, but it needs to be work that the board desires to be brought back. So um, we're not looking to spend money on deferred maintenance right now or that authorization um, need a direction. And I'm starting to hear pretty clear direction, bring back more information that the board can help prioritize and we can re-engage in that conversation. Got it, we can absolutely do that. Um, we need to put a plan together for the potential expansion of classroom space in the short term um, in, uh, in the elementary classroom um, silo. Um, the, the authorization for the board to expend money on the de developer fees really is incumbent upon, is there interest in moving forward learning about the possibilities at Bray Junior High School? So that middle one to me is the most, it seems like the most pressing 
as far as decisions and, and what like numbers we need to know or forecasting, whatever the tools are that Rick has, because all those other questions I was asking earlier, I would hope would be addressed by that. And then there's, again, and for me, there's two options. There's not doing the, doing the middle school model and then there's doing the middle school model. So I think for me, that middle one hinges on the question for me um, in reference to moving forward with the junior high. Um, I haven't, I have a problem when I see it on the slide like this too, that it's a building and a gymnasium and an expansion of the cafeteria. There's no way we have enough money for that. I mean, even with, that would take, again, the rough number in our, I, I, again, I'm trying to remember exactly, but I'm pretty sure it was six and six and then expansion of the cafeteria, that's at least another, call it a quarter. Um, there's no way we can do it. So I don't know why we would do a gymnasium analysis if we can't do a gymnasium right now. That's like a much later down the road project. It just is. So yeah. for me, part, that's part of it might be just the over. part of it might be just the efficiency um, and economy of if we're coming out to do a study. What would it really be to build this out the way that that's necessary? And then you can pick but and then choose. You're pieces. promising people, including our staff that that's what it's gonna look like. And I don't think we can afford it. So I, I can't, that, that one, I can't support it. it. Worded the way it is right now. I just think you're, we're opening up Pandora's box for um, the gymnasium is a totally separate issue. I mean, it's again, something we would all love, but it is a, it, that's a wish, not a, not, not a need. Do you see um, the cafeteria expansion as being different from the gymnasium or? Are you talking uh, about the food service prep area? I, I'm talking We've about been just. This one before. Pardon me? We've I'm been sorry. through this conversation before. We need a bigger kitchen to be able to support mm -hmm. more kids. Yeah. The, the that, prep that, area. Sure. But, but that would be a part of a feasibility study. We tell them what our desire is. Then they look at how you might be able to do that in expanding the seating area further out allows them to push the kitchen further out and create more space. But um, if we're contemplating having a half again, as many more kids on campus, um, yeah, they would be prepping food for a lot more kids. And so, whereas the gym may be looked upon as a luxury, I don't know that the cafeteria um, prep and or- You're gonna have to put tables outside. Space. I mean, again, these are all wish to me, that's a total wish item, especially after all we went through when, with the seven periods and we went through this one lunch versus two lunches. And, you know, it was absolutely came back that we could do it with one lunch, the prep, you know, that conversation is very fresh in my mind. So yeah, the kitchen part of it would have to be reconfigured if you're going to support this many kids but we're going to have to just look at outside space for kids to eat. There's no way we can build a gymnasium to have people eating lunch in it. Okay. So that one, I, um, I can't, I can't support it the way it's worded. So, and the deferred maintenance, I just really wish that we had more numbers right now because I think yeah. we could at least get started. Part, part of the issue with the deferred, part of the issue with the deferred maintenance is that it is a downstream issue from classroom capacity. That That is absolutely the driving priority because as deferred maintenance things go from getting old and rickety to broken, they will get addressed and, and get fixed. Or some of these facilities like tennis, the unplayable and some of it's the slope and, and others are just the opening fissures in the, in the, um, in the, um, the, the tennis court. And some of that was crack filled before, but, but that's proven in ineffective in, in long-term solution so um but in the context of everything we have to know that we're going to spend money on mm -hmm. i mean and i don't even want to get to this place but you could be coming at some point to us and saying we need to do the tennis courts in the pool and we might have to say we can't do it right yep but it so, helps to know kind I mean, of what the dollars that's might our be. reality i mean we <laughs> really need to yep. understand like that's what we could be saying someday that we sure. can't do it and you know, Rick's talking about those walkways in the stadium and how many of our friends around us had to close their stadiums. You know, we had Fullerton and uh, Fred Kelly that they wouldn't let people in them anymore um, due to whatever, as soon as you crack underneath the ground, you, you realize that, oh my gosh, we, 
this is not somewhere where we can have people. So I just. So, so for the, if, if I, I could double back anything. on the, if I could double, I, I, I've heard feedback that there's an interest from the board to bring back a deferred maintenance list for a separate conversation that really allows us to analyze those things. So that, that's a carve out, that's, that's a, a separate engagement activity with the board and we will, we will uh, um, work towards that and make plans for that and, and calendar that. <clears throat> On the elementary classroom space, I've heard people say that you know, there's a certain amount of non-negotiable. You can't not have enough space for for your students. And so work on that plan, bring back a recommendation. On the junior high side, Gail, am I hearing you say yes for the classroom and no for the gym and the cafeteria? Or because it's written I, I as such, I can't. I can't. Some, you have to do something with the cafeteria and when cafeteria, right. yeah. the back okay. end of the cafeteria, okay. whatever that means. But. Yeah. Okay. Prep area the, the prep area, the kitchen. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you're okay with a feasibility study on the expansion of classroom space there in the cafeteria, but not the gymnasium. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm just trying to clarify. That's pretty accurate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think everybody here has pretty much said everything eloquently enough where I don't have to add a whole bunch of stuff on there. One quick question I have for Rick is, and this is just for the audiences who watches this tonight and people watch it later. Just confirm the state of California has ordered the city to produce so many units of housing in the next several years. And that is coming no matter what. Correct? That's my understanding. Okay. So we have, this is not a, this is not a guess. This is a, this is going to happen. Like I said, the timeline might shift more to the left or right, or it might be 2026 or 20, but they have a plan to move forward with building. Okay. Whether the impact from the state order or not, there's already projects in place. But, nice. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The city is not anticipating because they find a plot of acres that are undeveloped. The things that are on his spreadsheet that show growth are people that have engaged the city with plans for development. So this is way beyond wish list. Um, Avalon Bay is in the process of being developed. Um, the mall is in processes of occurring and era 265 continues to have every two weeks or something like that meetings with the city um, continue to advance their plans. The economy can slow these down, as Rick said, can move, you know, shift things to the left or the right, but it doesn't change the fact that these police plots of land are already identified for development, which will generate children. And we're just trying to get ahead of the storm and um, and contemplate the the capacity and the impact that that's going to be and bring you plans. So perfect. That's all what right. tonight has largely been about. Perfect. I'm I'm on board with all three of these things, and everyone else had the reasons for it, so that's good. Um, that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. All right, well, we are going to go back into a closed session. So that's it for tonight. Um, we will see you on the 24th. Uh, until then, be good to one another. This is adjourned.